Quiet down, please, quiet down. We're about to start. We're about to start, guys. Can everybody please be seated? The hearing is now coming to order. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to this joint hearing on the committees on public housing and public safety. I am council member Alika Ampre Samuel, and I chair the public housing committee. I am joined by chair of the committee on public safety, council member Donovan Richards. We are also joined by council members, Diana Ayala, Cabrera, Rory Lansman, Keith Powers, Deutsch, Cohen, and I saw Councilmember Reynoso just a few seconds ago. The purpose of today's hearing is to discuss safety and security in NYCHA. When we scheduled this hearing, it was immediately after an 83-year-old woman, Ms. Jacobs, was beaten to death inside of her NYCHA apartment in my hometown of Brownsville. I did not know how unfortunately timely this scheduled hearing would be. Just yesterday, a seven-year-old boy was shot in broad daylight in the courtyard of Millbrook Houses, a NYCHA development in the Bronx. Thankfully, the child survived, but others are less fortunate. On Monday, a 31-year-old was shot in the head at a NYCHA development and pronounced dead at the scene. A 15-year-old girl was shot in the leg in the Bushwick Houses on Tuesday night, and I saw there was a press conference yesterday. It has been said that a society is measured by how it treats its most vulnerable members. In the wake of incidents like these, today I cannot say that New York City is measuring up. NYCHA tenants are organizing for change and demanding support to improve the safety conditions of their communities. Residents should not have to live in fear of crime. Crucially, however, residents should not have to live in the fear of police either. Black, brown, and low-income communities are often over-policed, but under-protected. Simply increasing police presence at NYCHA can lead to increased arrests and the collateral consequences that go with them, creating a host of additional problems. There has to be a better way to keep communities safe. In February, Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner O'Neill held a Comstat event at the MAP site Van Dyke Houses and around that same time, Commissioner O'Neill returned to Van Dyke to host a roundtable discussion about the increase in crime in the community. He was also interviewed by Sade Baderanwa with Eyewitness News in the clip titled, Walking New York City's Most Dangerous Street Between Tilden Houses and Brownsville Houses. And I'll highlight that both Van Dyke Houses and Brownsville Houses are map sites, and they both are in my district. I appreciate that NYCHA and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the NYPD, and other agencies have implemented numerous programs under the Mayor's Action Plan for safety, for neighborhood safety and MAP. And, but there has not been a hearing on MAP since the concept was introduced. And I look forward to receiving an update today on NYCHA's efforts to promote safety and security without relying on a criminal justice system exclusively. NYCHA aims to provide safe, affordable housing to low and moderate New Yorkers. Safe housing is not just part of NYCHA's mission statement, it should be a moral necessity. NYCHA, mayoral agencies, and the council must work together to protect the hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers that call NYCHA home. I am not here today to highlight negative stories about NYCHA developments and I'm not here to cause any kind of blame. Families work hard every day and simply deserve a clean and safe home. This is about finding out who is working on what and how together we can work to make the lives of families better. Simple, period, that's it. So next you'll hear from Chair of the Public Safety Committee, my colleague Donovan Richards. Thank you, Chair. And before I begin, I 
am in a lot of pain this morning. Um, God willing, the ibuprofen kicks in for this wisdom tooth. Um, but before I begin, I want to um, start by uh, asking for a moment of silence for Deputy Chief Stephen Silks uh, from Patrol Borough Queens North, who uh, unfortunately uh, uh, met a demise last night. So I just want to um, uh, do a moment of silence for him. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Amphrey Samuel, for convening this hearing today. I am Councilmember Donovan Richards from the 31st District in Queens, and I am the Chair of the Public Safety Committee. When we talk about safety and security in NYCHA, there are some things that we have to keep in mind that present some unique challenges for the police department. The first is that we are talking about people's homes. Tenants in public housing deserve to feel as safe as every New Yorker who lives in private housing. They deserve to be as safe in their homes as New Yorkers in private housing. I have no doubt that the department takes their mission to keep, in night, keep people in NYCHA safe very seriously. However, the second thing we have to keep in mind is that there are certain law enforcement tactics that NYCHA tenants have experienced over the years that have the potential to make tenants feel just as unsafe in their homes as crime. I don't think anyone wants to return to the era not so long ago when thousands of individuals every year were arrested for minor trespassing charges because they didn't have their ID on them or because they didn't want to bring a cop to their friend's front door in order to prove that they knew someone in the building. I don't doubt that the department had the prevention of violent crime and drug dealing in mind when they enforced those policies. But I simply do not agree that preventing violent crime requires a heavy-handed approach to minor nonviolent offenses. Unnecessary arrests for minor offenses cause people to become mistrustful of cops, and that wasn't good for people, and it wasn't good for cops. The good news is that I believe the department largely agrees with me. Arrests are down, way down, and I commend the NYPD for looking for other ways to keep NYCHA buildings safe while also looking to community policing models and targeted enforcement in order to build trust within the communities that the department is charged with protecting. I believe there are more points of agreement on some of the things I want to focus on today. Ultimately, crime prevention should not always fall on the shoulders of the police department. There is a limit to what we ought to ask of them. Vertical patrols become one symbol of an era of policing that I want to move on from, primarily because of how it impacted those communities. But I think even Pat Lynch would agree with me that asking cops to go up and down poorly lit stairwells looking for pe people to arrest isn't just bad for the people who live there, it is a danger to the officers as well. We need to focus not on how law enforcement measures keeping people safe, but on how we can improve the overall conditions in NYCHA that often lead to crime. Crime prevention is about community building. It's about sound infrastructure. It's about creating safe and well-maintained public spaces. I think the NYPD can be a valuable partner in pursuing those goals because they are out there day in and day out. But ultimately, it shouldn't be on them to fix every problem. Don't get me wrong, violent crime needs to be addressed, but ultimately, the long-term solution to violent crime will come from investing in people, not arresting them. I look forward to hearing what the administration has planned to keep NYCHA residents safe and what the NYPD believes needs to be done to make their jobs easier. With that being said, I will turn it back over to my co-chair. I want to thank you uh, for for co-hosting this important hearing. Residents of NYCHA deserve to feel safe um, like any other people in New York City. Shouldn't be predicated necessarily on their zip codes or their socioeconomic status. Residents deserve to be safe, and that's what we hope to accomplish today in this hearing. Thank you. We have just been joined by Majority Leader Councilmember Cumbo, as well as Councilmember Vallone. So the first panel we will hear from will be residents of NYCHA. As we do in our public housing hearings, we'd like to hear from the residents first before we hear from the agencies. 
And so with that, we will hear from um, a young resident as well as um, residents from the MAP sites, as well as um, someone representing Bushwick houses. We have a lot of residents who have signed up to testify today, but we will only be able to have a small um, testimony panel first, then we'll hear from the agencies, and then we'll go back to the resident panels after. But we cannot hear all of the residents um, before we hear from the agency. So. Joseph Hines from Tompkins Houses. Juan Ramos, Los Sudes, Bushwick, Instat team. Trudy Pogue, I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong. Franklin Avenue Tenant Association. And we'll also hear from a development that does not have a map site um, to help with the discussion when the agencies come forth. So we'll also hear from Mr. Reggie Bowman representing Cephalo Houses and Seacott Brooklyn East. and Ms. Rhonda Bennett from Polo Ground. Okay, we'll start with Bushwick, and we're gonna have to put you on a clock. So that we'll put the clock on for three minutes, okay? Good morning, my name is Juan Ramos. Um, I am with an organization in Williamsburg in Bushwick called Los Sudes, Southside United. Um, and we operate the MAP team there. Um, we also work very closely with a program that we started there under the Neighborhood Public Safety Coalition called the Wick Against Violence. Um, and we have some of our members in the audience, so I just want to shout them out. Um, I want to thank the council members for having us here today, uh, for holding this hearing. Um, that is very important, not only to the NYCHA residents, but also the residents that they engage outside of the development, um, because that goes hand in hand as well, and sometimes we forget that those interactions mean a lot, um, because the residents outside of development also have a responsibility to the safety of the people in the development. Um, so I just want to, in the recent days, we've heard a lot about what's happened in Bushwick with some of the violence. We know that just over a year ago, we had an anniversary of a double homicide that occurred there uh, to elderly people. Um, and recently, as yesterday, the day before yesterday, we had a young lady that was grazed in the hip during a shootout. Um, and while we hear all these things in the news, what we don't hear is the good things that are happening at Bushwick. And I wanna kind of focus on that first, because there are a lot of good things happening in Bushwick since the MAP initiative came to Bushwick. Um, for example, we were able to engage residents who at one point in the development weren't aware of many of the things that were happening at the development in order to get people engaged and ready to speak up uh, out against the violence. Um, I'm happy to say that through our initiative, we were able not only to engage residents, but get them involved to the point where a lot of them today are now part of the resident association when the resident association was almost not non-operational. Um, which is an activation onto itself, which, me which means a lot in order for people to stop the violence in their development. Um, through our initiative, we also were able to um, begin the Wick Against Violence through the help of MACJ, um, which um, helps us put a team of violence interrupters on the ground and interacting with some of the most um, violent individuals at the development, but also the most vulnerable, in vulnerable individuals at the development because they're one and the same. Um, when we look at violence in the, in the development, what we, what we tend to see is that we point the finger at those that we think are the bad guys, but little do we know that they're also the ones that are vulnerable to some of the violence. And overall, what I can say in ending it um, is that 
when we look at the violence at NYCHA, what I hear from the residents and what I've, I've seen and observed myself is that we need to better define violence. We need better, better to define what it means to have disinvestment in, in NYCHA because it begins with how I feel about being in my apartment and how safe I feel about being in, in the grounds in my development. And those go, those go one and the same because if I'm not happy with what I have in my, in my apartment and I go outside and I feel just as bad, then I just give up hope. And what we're trying to bring to the development is hope. And I think that's what MAP has done. I think that's what the Wick Against Violence is doing in Bushwick. And I just want to stand up and say for the residents of Bushwick that they're also sick and tired of seeing the news. They're also sick and tired of being, not being able to sit in their development and watch their kids play. And a lot of them have stood up. And, and now I ha I'm happy to say that over the last year, we've had over seven shooting incidents. And the residents have responded to each one when, then, when in the past there was never anyone standing up against shootings or speaking out against shootings. And we responded to each one with the residents leading the way. And I think that um, the last incident where we saw a young lady that was murdered, for example, um, at the hands of her boyfriend, we invited the development that she actually lived in to join us. And we, have, we had over 50 members of, of Cabana Houses join us at Bushwick Houses for a vigil for that victim. And as they were leaving, they spoke to the residents of Bushwick and say, how did you guys organize this? And how can we bring this program to our development because we need something like this. But I, I commend the residents of Bushwick for standing up and saying we want to do something about this. And they've done that. Um, so with people power and agency power and the resources of the, of the um, city council and all the other institutions that can provide us assistance, we can go a, a, lot, go a whole lot more and go harder and harder each year to make things better. And the last thing I'll say about Bushwick is that we also need to study the violence at, at most of the developments because what I can say about Bushwick is that a lot of the violence that takes place, studying it and being involved on the street on it, a lot of the violence doesn't come necessarily from the people that live at Bushwick. A lot of the violence comes to Bushwick. Okay. Um, and, we need, and we need to Study that because, again, the initiatives that we put into the developments are great, but this needs a citywide effort, resources invested in the entire community. Um, and if we invest more in policing than, we do, than, we, than what we do in the developments and the surrounding areas of the development, then that's a disservice to the community overall. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, wait, I know there are a lot of people here who have, um, this is their first time coming to a council hearing. We do not clap or um, have loud outbursts. We ask that if you do want to express how you feel, you can do this. But please do not clap or um, speak or um, have loud outbursts. But thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Joseph Hans. Um, I started work as a youth worker with um, Ahmed Danielle. Last April, I received training in the community community safety, but in a way, I um always been worried about my community and, and the safety. So I always been on every on basically on everybody in my community because that's what you're supposed to be in a community for. And we worked on like two action plans: one the the basketball program, and other one is the music program. The purpose of um renovating the basketball court is to show the community that we could use the outdoor space for, we could use the outdoor space for more than basketball. And uh, in April, we hosted our first roller skating event, um, bringing the whole community out. Over like 200 people came out and enjoyed each other. Um, companies, I mean, everybody got along, no problems. And that's just showing one thing, that people could come out and it could be no problems on a regular day. It could be any day. And we bring up, also bring, trying to bring them back the um, basketball tournament for the summer because to get everybody got their certain talents with this um, basketball, singing, anything. So we want to like express and bring out everybody background and just make everybody feel right like in the community. And for um, the violence, I feel like it's just going down. Like as long as we just continue to put effort into back into the community, like he said, like not into everything policing, policing. 
it got to be back to the people and give back to the people and see what they go give back. Like if the effort is, if y'all showing the effort to everybody and y'all bringing us all this stuff, I think, and giving us something to do instead of being bored and sitting around, maybe bring everybody out and show everybody here now, this is what, this is what we're supposed to be doing instead of this is what we're not supposed to be doing. Give them something to do. And I think by bringing um, Instep and, you know, MAP to the communities, it's just changing all around. Like, everything is just improving to me. I just feel like for everybody to come together and be who they are and feel like they can express themselves, that's always going to be a positive vibe, you know? But besides that, um, I'm not really, like, Sure, like well, what y'all, everything y'all expect from our side, we always go uphold it and make sure we do it. Like, no violence, no, like, I don't know, like, I don't know what that, y'all wanna ex expect, we gonna do it. Like, I don't know, it's a change, it's time for a change, and somebody gotta do it. So, if it gotta take instead to move this movement, then everybody should just be alongside it. And that's why I'm alongside it. Thank you. And can you um, state your development again? Tonkin's Houses. Tonkin's Houses. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for thank being you. here. And thank you for being a leader in your community. I'm proud of you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you. I think you're not on. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Trudy Pogue. I'm the Tenant Association President in the Bronx at 1325 Franklin Avenue. I'm also Resident Watch Supervisor, which is, uh, my title is um, so City Security Aid. Okay, um, I'm here this morning because I have issues and I want it to be known. I've spoken to numerous of people, to my district leaders, manager office, PSA 7 and nothing has been done. We had an incident there. It's a senior development, first of all, okay? We don't have locked doors. I have a picture with tape on, on the door, on the lock, okay? We have, um, we have the homeless coming in and using the stairways as public bathroom, like a bathroom for toilets. Also, there had been an incident there that was swept under the rug, and I'm not pleased about it, okay, because we had a senior there that was choked by a homeless man. We reported it, the guy was picked up, he went, they locked him up for a few days, they told the tenant not to come to court. I don't understand it, because to me that was a criminal act. And I consider that as attempted murder, because if I didn't raise a cane at that gentleman, who knows if he would have choked her to death. Okay, and that was swept under the rug. Our development at 1325 Franklin Avenue in the Bronx is like it's not even on the map. I make complaints, I've, I've made numerous of complaints. As I said, district leaders, I've called them in, I've toured them through the building, I showed them uh, pictures, they have taken pictures, and nothing has been done. And this has been going on for about two years or so now. Enough is enough. Someone has to do something. I wanted to take Niger to court, get the tenants together and go to court with the situation, but being that these are seniors, a lot of them are ill, they cannot go, they, they're afraid, some of them even afraid to come out their apartment because of this homeless gentleman that is allowed to come on the premises whenever he feels like. Some people call it his building, say he owned the building. This is what they are saying. And, and, and I mean, I've, I've had enough, the tenants have had enough. Okay, someone has to do something. Thank you. Good morning, um, my name is Rhonda Bennett. I represent Polo Ground Towers. I'm the resident association president. i um, been residing there 50 years. Um, my, it's not so much of a complaint, but my worries is that we have a lot of youths that's doing a lot of the 
the crimes, but a good thing is that one of the youths, sad to say, but he's been incarcerated, and so far since he's been incarcerated, no one has been getting robbed. So to this day, I kind of commend that, but it's a sad situation that he had to be incarcerated for the petty robberies to stop. I'm asking for NYPD to, they work closely with us, but my problem is that we have NCO officers that really have time to work with us because they're always in training. Training to do this, training to do that. And how do you get a community together if you're not able to work with outside agencies because there's so much training? Um, also, safety and our development, far as our buildings, we were having um, FDNY breaking our locks to get into our buildings, so that became an issue. Um, the locks, you know, they cost a whole lot of money, and it took us, like, a big fight. It was my building that they actually broke into. Another building, our building, building 3, 29, 49, 55, as soon as the locks get fixed, they break them again. I don't understand that we have cameras on each one of these buildings. So we have to, NYCHA has to do their part and view these cameras to see who's breaking these doors. NYPD need to do their part and get these people that's breaking our doors because it's useless to have locked doors that's always unlocked. Through our, our mayor's action team, it's becoming a success. We work very hard thanks to court intervention, Center for Court Intervention, um, my team over there, I congratulate y'all on what we put together and we're actually trying to work with the septic through crime, through prevention of environmental design, and we're trying to plant gardens, but that's on a halt because right now we have so much construction with the buildings. Um, they're doing the pointing of the buildings, so that is now an issue because we have all of this scaffolding and then all of this netting, which you cannot even see through it. So therefore, the way they have our buildings blocked off and closed up, you're walking through a tunnel, which I, am, I ask, can we please have cameras put up under those scaffolds? Because I think that is an entrapment area, and we need that better lit, cameras there, and also with that construction, Department of Buildings must be okay their plans, but it's also a danger because our emergency vehicles cannot come through our development the way they need to to reach somebody in a building. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. Good morning. My name is Reginald Bowman. I'm here representing the Citywide Council of Presidents this morning, which is the NYCHA group that represents the residents of public housing citywide. I'm also here on behalf of the residents of Cephalo Houses in Brownsville, and I'm going to be very brief. I just want to first of all commend the chair and the co-chair for their efforts. I'd also like to commend the mayor for MAP. I think that it's a very important program that is beginning to address one of the most serious issues that exist in the public housing community in the city of New York. Back in the 1980s, I sat in this very spot and talked about the necessity of security for public housing then. As many of you know, the history of the public housing police came from a program that was started in the community and eventually led to there being a police department that was dedicated to public housing in New York. Presently, we are faced with, again, the same problem 
rearing its head. And here in the 19th year of the 21st century, we are still talking about how to secure our buildings, and we have a very serious problem going on. Again, not criticizing the city or the residents who have been working together, I think it's important for a couple of things to be considered as we move forward. Because if we're going to stem the violence and the victimization that happens on our grounds, and we're going to make our homes safe and secure as dictated by the 24 CFR 964 regulations, we're going to have to use 21st century techniques and um, standards in order to make that happen. Last night while I was preparing for this, I came across various companies that do security and surveillance and create the kind of equipment that's necessary to secure large facilities and large developments. And I've often wondered, as I come through security here in, this, in the uh, City Hall and as I go through security into the NYCHA buildings, how they're able to make sure that their buildings are secure and not invaded by the public, but they still don't s seem to get the fact that if you really want to secure our buildings, you're going to have to put some similar systems into our buildings. Make no mistake about it, cameras don't stop crime. Cameras do not stop crime, especially cameras that are not used for surveillance and are not being watched by anyone so that there can be a response when that crime happens as opposed to recording the crime and then responding to it afterwards. So all I'm suggesting at this point as we go forward with this process of securing the most vulnerable in the public housing community is that we start investing our money in the modern surveillance systems that are used in the high rises like the Needle on Park Avenue, like getting into this building, like getting into NYCHA. Unless we secure our buildings' entrances and their exits, unless we secure them with surveillance systems that work, we're going to be back here doing this over and over again as people keep being victimized over and over again. So my recommendation again is that we continue this process of engagement that's very important, and I commend that. But we also have to start looking into the 21st century solutions of surveillance and security that are keeping 50% of this city secure when they're in their large buildings and you can't, if one of us tried to get into their buildings on a, on a, on a bad day, we would be stopped at the perimeter. So my suggestion again is that we start using uh, 21st century systems for this current problem that we're dealing with in public housing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ms. Trudy. Oh, hello. There's something that I failed to mention. Um, not only do they allow this homeless gentleman to continue to take over the place, they're forcing the lady that he choked to move out of the development. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. It's always helpful to be able to hear what's happening in the developments from the families, from the residents, as we go into our discussion with the agencies. So thank you so much. Okay, so now we'll hear from the agencies. So representing NYCHA, we have Carolyn Jasper, Vice President of Operations. We have Yuka Buskett with NYCHA. Rodriguez from NYCHA. 
Chief Secreto from NYPD and Executive Director Oleg NYPD. Sorry, Oleg. Do you want me to try? Okay. Oh, there you go. Chirk Nosky. I can't say it, so don't worry about it. <laughs> and we've also been joined by Councilmember Miller and Councilmember Van Bremer. And Council will sway you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Okay, take it away. And please state your name and position. Turn on the mic, let's start over. My name is Renita Francois, and I am the executive director of the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, which I will say again. Good morning, Chairperson Amprey Samuel, Chairperson Richards, members of the Public Housing and Public Safety Committees, and residents of the great city we serve. My name is Renita Francois, and I am the executive director of the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, which is overseen by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and thank you to Council, the District Attorney's Office, and the Mayor for your investment in MAP. I am joined today by Carolyn Jasper from NYCHA and Chief James Secreto from the City of New York Police Department. I stand before you having witnessed what happens when everyday people are in the driver's seat of a vehicle designed to drive change. For decades, crime has concentrated in black and brown neighborhoods where poverty, unemployment, negative health outcomes, and insufficient resources also existed. This reality, as we know, not only impacted the well-being of the residents who lived in those neighborhoods, but also their safety, which is inextricably connected. There have always been people in community working to change this. Unfortunately, government hasn't always done enough to be the partner and supporter residents deserve. Confronting this legacy requires acknowledgement that public safety demands a team effort and that residents must be at the heart of it. It is not just about crime and policing. Handcuffs and jail cells will not solve our problems. As the city endeavors to reduce the jail population and lighten the touch of enforcement, we must work hand in hand with residents to build the resource infrastructure that will stop the flow of our young people into the criminal justice system. It calls for acting on decades of experience and research demonstrating that safety is the organic result of access to learning, work, and play along with revitalized physical environments that bring people together and promote civic engagement. When we started MAP in 2014, we set out to tackle this injustice in 15 disenfranchised communities head on with the support of NYCHA, the NYPD, and city agency partners by connecting the city's resources on the ground, expanding opportunities for work and play and increased health and well-being, investing in the built environment, and ultimately by building a space where residents and government could come together to solve problems. Residents of underserved communities have gone for too long without a say in how to best increase safety in their neighborhoods. But as once was powerfully said to me, residents don't need a voice for the voiceless. They need the mic. Neighborhood Stat was designed to be a platform for the city and neighborhoods to work together. It is designed to amplify community voice. It was designed for residents to lead. To support resident leadership, we have contracted with our partners at the Center for Court Innovation Los Sures and also Jacob Reese to support residents in building their capacity and hired organizers called MAP engagement coordinators for each development. Residents teams that consist of three youth, nine adults and three seniors receive trainings and methodologies like crime prevention through environmental design and $50,000 per team to implement projects that address a physical space vulnerability using the methodology with the support of NYCHA. Since its launch, Neighborhood Stat has brought together hundreds of residents, city agency partners, and CBOs to strategize around the priority areas residents are telling us will make them feel safe. We have a responsibility to listen and to respond, as well as contribute the knowledge and perspective that government agencies bring. What I have heard from residents in the MAP communities is not that they want something extra. They want what we all want, equity and fairness. Through neighborhood stat, residents have told us they want equitable access to and investment in their spaces. 
They have taken the first steps in several communities with the support of NYCHA using their SEPTED project funds to activate an underutilized site on the campus to transform it into an outdoor community space with a shipping container, ground mural, inflatable tents, temporary stage, and temporary lighting, coupled with additional social programming at Wagner houses. To support culturally relevant revitalization, interactive space activation, and informational social programming at three critical hotspots, Dr. Green Playground, PS125 Playground, AKA Shady Side, and a NYCHA outdoor communal space, AKA The Middle, in order to improve perceptions of safety and encourage pro-social activity at Brownsville houses. To activate an existing computer lab at St. Nicholas to train out of school, out of work youth to create a tech platform for connecting residents to resources. To address gun violence through a music mentorship program for mid to high risk youth ages 16 to 24 that supports young adults in addressing social service needs and developing a civic project that focuses on anti-violence messaging developed in weekly workshops and hotspot activations at Tompkins houses. Three such events are happening tomorrow at Wagner, Butler, and Brownsville houses. We welcome you to experience it for yourselves. They want to work with their local precincts and, pre and PSAs to bridge the gap and build relationships between officers and a wider cross-section of community members. This will ensure a two-way line of communication, like in Castle Hill, where officers are working together with residents to reclaim 530 Olmstead and turn the surrounding green space once known for its troubled reputation into Unity Park. It will also ensure they are treated fairly and justly in their interactions with law enforcement. With NCOs participating regu regularly in the NSTAT stakeholder team meetings, there's a space for dialogue and sharing to occur. They want access to job training, skill building, and employment opportunities. We are working with our partners at DYCD, WorkDev, Green City Force, Jobs Plus, NYCHA Reese, and private partners to understand the gaps residents have identified and the steps necessary to fill them. They want support for community wellness and mental health resources. We are working with our partners at DOHMH to connect the teams that deal with the issues residents raise in their priority areas, including substance and alcohol abuse, mental health, and health disparities. To understand how we arrive at these priorities and solutions, we brought an example from the Castle Hill houses to help illuminate the neighborhood staff process, which we will see at the end. The consistency of asks from neighborhoods across the city indicate a need to develop system-level responses to these challenges. Beyond providing access to resources in general, it is MAP's goal to be guided by residents to develop and deliver the right resources to the right places at the right time. That is the true opportunity that MAP provides, a coordinated effort to support communities to prevent crime by following their guidance on how to invest in the well-being of their neighborhood. A healthy neighborhood is a safe neighborhood. By traditional measures, MAP sites have seen a 9% overall reduction in total index crime, with violent crime falling 8% for, from 2014 to 2018, outpacing the 4% decline throughout the city's public housing developments during the same period. Year-to-date, MAP sites are down 14% in index crimes and 15% in violent crime, outpacing the city's 8% reduction in both categories year-to-date, and the rest of NYCHA's 2 and 4% respectively. We are currently in the middle of an evaluation that will tell us more about our impact on safety in MAP communities and residents' perception of that impact. In the interim, what we do know about this model, which is being held up nationally and internationally as a model for government and community partnership, is that residents are voting with their feet. Since the Neighborhood Stats full rollout, more than 21,000 people have been engaged in this process through public outreach meetings and events, with 220 residents taking an active leadership role in resident stakeholder teams. To sustain this momentum and repair decades of mistrust with neighborhoods that have been neglected, it's critical that we, the city partners, continue to show up in this process and follow through on our commitments. Continued engagement from agencies and leveraging civic participation is paramount, and we remain steadfast in our commitments with our agency partners, both present at this table and our other sister agencies. Uh, we would just like to briefly show an example from Castle Hill. That this is community space, that the power in this room is shared, that everyone in here has a voice, um, that we want to hear that voice, and that we uh, want to be focused on solutions. The neighborhood stat is a process that we developed here at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice that really serves as um, a, a meeting ground uh, for the city and for residents. So. The goal of Neighborhood Stat is really 
to identify not just the problems about communities, but really being intentional and strategic about how we facilitate the solutions. Neighborhood Stat happens at two levels. In the local community, it's a multi-step process that begins with a map engagement coordinator at each site, um, recruiting and facilitating a stakeholder team of 15 residents, including youth, and city agency partners who work in the community. And those teams work together over the course of several months to really establish what their community safety priorities are. Residents do a tremendous job of um, digging into what types of data points would substantiate their feelings. Um, and we don't, we do believe that people's perceptions and people's feelings are data points. People's lived experience are data points. First we did is we put everything together, right? The next step, step is we find the data. We identify the data and make sure out, is this project something we really need to do? Based on what you guys collected, it is. Yeah. Like, we, this is a start. You're going to hear it many times, right? And I think you heard it, like, why are you, cho why are you choosing the boot building? We're trying to change the culture. What are we trying to change the name to? Unity Park. Unity Park. Look, you Pop guys, let me tell you something. And I'm not saying this to come at you. You guys know this by heart. You can't just start with something small, right? We have to start something big to make people believe us. Right. Do you believe I was gonna, we was gonna turn this to basketball court? No. He thought I was bugging, right? Yeah, but you gave me hope. Gave you hope? You had hope already, but it was No, no, no you, you gave us hope, because I was getting ready to move, okay? <laughs> Out of here, man. No, serious. <laughs> you gave us a lot of hope, and, and, and you know, well, you changed my way of thinking. I said, okay, if this young man that don't even live in this neighborhood could come in this neighborhood and encourage all these kids that were born and raised in this neighborhood to do the right thing, me as an adult, I got to follow him. And so once those priority areas are developed, they are then presented to the community at local instat. Local instat is called such because it takes place right in the heart of the community at the development. And it's our stakeholder teams are presenting their priorities and um, their projects to the community for a sort of ratification. To do the best that we can to make it better. To um, and when we come to the central neighborhood stat meeting, we have a facilitated dialogue about responding to the problems as we've identified them. And residents are present in the room and are able to ask questions of um, their government and of the community-based organizations from their neighborhood. And they're able to get a lot of responses and feedback right there in the room. If sanitation can speak to the garbage pickup, um, you said that there is no curbside pickup. Is there a reason why it has to be that way? Castle Hill is known as a dumping ground. They, they deal with a lot of outside communities bringing industrial waste into the area and dumping. If the police department can talk about how people can alert you to illegal dumping, if there's any activities that you are already doing around illegal dumping. I've been in communication with um, Community Board 9 and Ms. Giles um, from NYCHA. And one thing I did was um, I got documentation from the ownership that posted claim the, the island. It is supposed to be Parks and Recs. It says that I have it right in my hand since January 17th, 1983, that it was signed. So I have it here. But, um, if Our seats. I have everything right here. I have emails. <laughs> I even sent it to Ms. Jobs to let her know we coming in with a paper just to say that um, we need something done. If it could be a strategy, talk about what's the next steps after me showing this documentation, but it says Parks and Recs supposed to take ownership. Does the NCOs, are they, um, are they aware of a specific time that this is happening, maybe we can do some observation and start doing some specific enforcement to that. We haven't seen specific, like a time frame, but we'll speak with the residents, see if we can narrow down the time frame as to when that's most and problematic. the team, maybe the team can also do some audits like you guys have done as part of your SEPTED um, project, do some audits on some dates and times to see if we can narrow it down. As a solution, are we able to have like um, stakeholders be into those meetings because stakeholders are always around and making sure they're doing the safety audits, making sure we're doing something. It seems like as a I'm, part of the joint operation. Yes, because yes, it would be great. great it would be great to be part of those um, meetings so we could be able to add on because even sometimes there's certain things you guys might not see that we see. So we want to be able to be part of that process so we could try to make this better. No one knows better about what happens in a community, both good and bad, than the people who live there. They are the experts on their neighborhood. We really want to set the tone that 
we're all on the same equal footing. We all want to see the same thing, which is to get to um, the solutions as the community has dictated them. And the only way that we can account for that diversity of, of thoughts and of individual and of landscape and of geography and of building type and of resident, um, the only way for us to account for that is to be constantly listening and constantly iterating on how to be better as a city. For us, it's not just about the crime data. It's about seeing a difference between the relationships and the connections in the community. We're not naive to the point where we think everything is going to be solved by one meeting, but at least if we plant the seed, um, we can continue to water it. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Carolyn Jasper, and I am Vice President of Public Housing of Operations with the New York City Housing Authority. Chairs, Alika Amphrey Samuel and Donovan Richards, members of the Committee on Public Housing and Public Safety and other distinguished members of the City Council. I am pleased to be joined by Raymond Rodriguez, Director of the Office of Safety and Security and other members of NYCHA's team. We also appreciate having our partners from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, MOGJ, and the NYPD with us today. In my role, I advise on the overall management of NYCHA's properties and directly oversee property management at approximately half of the authority's portfolio. As a landlord, we know that good maintenance of our buildings and other infrastructures correlates to crime deterrence. Mr. Rodriguez's team, at the Office of Safety and Security is responsible for protecting the authority's properties, employees, and residents. Thank you for convening this hearing on this very important topic and for the opportunity to provide you with an overview of our efforts to enhance the safety and security of NYCHA developments. As a landlord, our top priority is ensuring safe and secure homes for the nearly 400,000 New Yorkers we serve. That aim is at the forefront of our mission and the focus of many elements of our work. Our approach to fostering safe communities is centered on investing in infrastructure that enhances building security, such as cameras, exterior lighting, and layered access controls. Collaborating with the nation's premier law enforcement agency, the NYPD, as well as MOCJ and other organizations, and partnering with residents and connecting them to opportunity. Physical security enhancements at our buildings. Recognizing the important role of security cameras and other security enhancements in making residents feel safe, we have been working hard to put these measures in place and obtain the funding to do so. Over the past two decades, NYCHA has installed nearly 16,600 security cameras at over 200 developments benefiting more than 310,000 residents. Since 2014, we've invested approximately $200 million in cameras and other security enhancements. Funding that's generously provided by city council members and other elected officials as well, as through programs like the Mayor's Office Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety and the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Since 2014, we have installed nearly 8,000 exterior lights at 78 developments, a $101 million investment in total. Our partners at the Dormitory Authority of the State of New York also installed more than $6 million of lighting at 13 locations in the past two years. In addition, we've put up 586 light towers to disrupt criminal activity at targeted locations and improve residents' quality of life. In the past six years, we've also installed layered access controls, new intercoms, and front door key fobs and hardware at 425 buildings across 76 developments. I'd like to thank the Council for funding many of these security enhancements, which improve the quality of life for residents across the city. Collaborating with safety and security experts, 
Ensuring safety is everyone's responsibility, and that is why we collaborate with our stakeholders to address safety and security concerns. Our partners at the NYPD are crime-fighting experts, and we work with them on the placement of security cameras and exterior lighting reloc and relocating cameras as needed. To help the NYPD solve crimes, we share security camera footage with them in the middle of the night if necessary. Since the beginning of the year, we've provided the NYPD with over 6,500 video recordings and provided other law enforcement agencies with nearly 2,000 video recordings. We are in constant communication with the NYPD. They regularly provide us with crime reports and valuable intel and statistics. For instance, we coordinate with the NYPD on all of our summer family days and our developments. They provide, provide police coverage, presence as well as any information that's relevant to ensuring the community's safety. And the NYPD's neighborhood coordination officers work closely on the ground with NYPD property managers as well as residents. It is truly a productive relationship. Led by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the $140 million Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety Map brings together residents and a range of city agencies to reduce crime at 15 NYCHA sites with historically high crime rates. Its holistic approach of physical improvements, such as exterior lighting, expanded programming, including job training and strengthened police, resident engagement is making a difference for the residents. For example, the Neighborhood STAT initiative brings together city government and resident leaders, community-based organizations, and other stakeholders for periodic meetings to address public safety issues specific to each map location. We continue to meet regularly with our partners at MOCJ to build upon the progress we are making through the Mayor's Action Plan, partnering with residents to foster safer communities. Of course, residents are a key partner in our work to make our development safer. For about a half a century, thousands of residents have volunteered their time as Resident Watch members, patrolling their developments and fostering safety, security, and community pride in collaboration with property management. To give our youth a safe, productive place to go, we are working with MOCJ and the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYDC, to keep 119 community centers at NYCHA's developments open until at least 11 p.m. this summer. Over the last several summers, an average of about 250 participants per site benefited from these extended hours. As part of our work to support the community, I am proud to say that NYCHA has facilitated more than 15,000 job placements since 2014. That is being accomplished through a variety of workforce development programs, from Jobs Plus to the NYCHA Resident Training Academy. Our Office of Resident Economic Empowerment and Sustainability will continue to help residents launch and advance their careers and open doors to additional opportunities for themselves and their families. Conclusion. Through NYCHA 2.0, our long-term st strategic plan, we are working hard to improve our residents' quality of life from completing repairs faster through skilled trades and maintenance work order blitz to implementing seven days a week janitorial services at our developments with alternate work schedules. The latter means more boots on the grounds and eyes on the street earlier in the day, later in the evening, and on weekends. A family's sense of safety is integral to their quality of life, and that basic tenant drives so much of the work that we do. We appreciate the support of our partners, including the NYPD, MOCJ, DYCD, and the City Council as we work with our residents to foster safe communities at NYCHA. We are especially thankful for funding from council members for security enhancements such as cameras and exterior lights and hope that you will continue to partner with us in these efforts. We need funding to not only install this infrastructure but also to continue to maintain it. Although we commit all available resources and work with our partners to ensure the safety of NYCHA communities, there is always that can and must be done. 
Thank you for your support as we continue to make progress for our residents. We are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I know that Chief Secreto is not giving testimony, but you're here to answer all the questions and provide uh, information. Um, so I'm just gonna get started. I know we have a ton of questions related to MAP, and MAP address is, is currently in 15 developments, but this is about NYCHA overall, so we will get to MAP. Um, so let's just first start with, in your testimony, Ms. Jasper, you mentioned, and this is just the beginning of your testimony, so just like clarification. Um, you mentioned oversight of half of the authority's portfolio. Directly oversee property management at approximately half of the authority's portfolio. What does that mean, half? Like, so what happens with the other, who manages the other half? Property management department is divided into six different departments. We have Queens and Staten Island department, we have mixed finance, we have Brooklyn, we have the Bronx, we have Manhattan, and we have NGO One. So I am responsible for overseeing half of the portfolio. Portfolio. I oversee the boroughs of Queens and Staten Island, I oversee Brooklyn, and I oversee mixed finance. Mixed finance has properties within the boroughs of Brooklyn, Manhattan, and also the Bronx. So when we say half of the authority's portfolio, that's about perhaps um, I oversee approximately 70,000 units and approximately 64,000 developments in total. And with that, I also oversee the, ma the, the directors are direct report to me. So I have three directors who oversee those three departments that report directly to me, and they have support staff that report to them who oversee the property management developments. Okay, so it's not like you have another, like a counterpart that oversee the other. Yes, and I apologize. Yes, we do. We also, right now, we have um, um, an interim vice president who is currently serving to other see the other half of the portfolio. And who is that? His name is Albert Ferguson. Okay. You also mentioned, and just now, so this is kind of getting into um, the weeds of the cameras and the actual safety and security. You outlined um, what NYCHA has done over the past two decades, right? And two decades is 20 years, right? And you mentioned how many cameras were installed over the past 20 years. And so my question is, can you talk to us about the lifespan of cameras because and like, what does that mean to mention you've installed a certain number of cameras over the past 20 years when we know that cameras, like cameras that were installed 20 years ago would be irrelevant to this conversation that we're having today? Or explain to me if I'm incorrect. Yes. So can you just break down the actual installation of cameras, how many cameras you have overall, and how many of them are actually operating today to standard, and how many of them do you feel um, should be replaced? And can you explain like the, the actual lifespan of cameras? Yes, council member, thank, thank you for you. that question. What I will do is that I will ask Steve Loveseed, who is the NYCHA senior advisor to the EVP of Capital Projects, I will ask him to come up and to give you more insight to your question. Okay. We have to swear you in. Yep. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And can you explain what you do again? Your yes. title is sound pretty lengthy. Thank you very much. My name is Stephen Lovesey. I'm the senior advisor to the executive vice president of Capital Projects. I do want to say that Deborah Goddard shares uh, her regards. Um, she was unable to attend this due to a previous schedule. Um, thank you very much for the question. So in terms of capital and where we are with the construction of, of a project, there is a warranty and guarantee um, 
the guarantee would be the workmanship of the layered access systems, the cameras, and the lighting. That's approximately one year. And then depending on the We always hear layered access system. So can you just explain that? What is a layered access yes. system? Yes. So a layered access system is the, the door fobs, the electrical locks that one has entering their building. Okay. Those systems have a warranty, depending on the components, anywhere from one year to 10 years. So I will get back to you in terms of your exact question on the life cycle or the life expectancy of a camera. Um, we do monitor all of those. And uh, as you know, we work with the council on older camera systems to upgrade those. So that way they are working with the overall SOC system and, and the, 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 the system. I don't know what SOC system is. I apologize. So um, going back to the layered access system, you said that there can be a, a warranty of anywhere from one year to 10 years? Depending on the components, yes. What does that mean? Because it costs so much money to put in a layered access system. And can you explain to me where a one-year warranty would be appropriate? That just sounds crazy. Mm -hmm. So usually the workmanship is a one-year guarantee. Um, the camera system, you're absolutely correct, is a complex system of, that, that has a cost associated to it. It's made up of many components. Um, what I mentioned was the SOC, which is the Security Operations Center. That is the network of computers and recording devices and software that is what we refer to as the brains of the system. And then you have the low voltage center. Those are all um, typically for one development, um, but there are some scenarios where developments share that system. And then once that system is in, and that's the most expensive portion of the component, uh, there okay, so breaking that down, if you have a development, let's say a development has no um, camera system at all, right? And uh, council or someone decides that they want to provide the funding for a system in that particular development, they would then need to purchase what first? Right, thank you. So we work with the council members to uh, analyze their, the development that they're speaking about if that system does not have that central brain, that is the first component. And that's the sock that you were talking about. Correct. That's so which the, is the brain. So mm -hmm. if it does not have that. That is basically the first piece of, that we have to have put in. So that way all of the cameras feed into that. Okay. And that's the most expensive piece. That is so the most then expensive the, piece. So that particular piece could last for how long? I don't have that information. I will get that information to you. Have you replaced any? Um, brains at all in a development that had one? So I'm, uh, unfortunately, I can't speak to that. I can direct you to the um, security systems who manage and maintain those um, pieces. The reason why I ask that question is because if you replaced it, then we can find out when it was installed the first time and when it needed to be replaced to get a sense of how long it lasts. And then the, the next series of questions would have been related to the cameras that were purchased to go directly with that SOC system and then determine how long those cameras last. And then the next question would have been um, like the level of crime that took place in that development that had that brain and those cameras. and, and so that's the reason for my questions. And I know when we did the briefing, um, I said I was going to ask that question. Okay. I've just, I've just been handed a card um, with... Excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I specifically said that I was going to ask direct questions about the lifespan of the cameras, the installation, and how many there were, and the costs associated yes. with it. So I've just received a card. Um, okay. From, it indicates that the camera's life expectancy is 10 years. Okay. Okay. So you and so over the past 20 years, right? According to your testimony, you, you installed how many cameras? So if they're 10 year life expectancy, so that means that those original set of cameras have they been replaced or are there in the queue a process to be replaced or is there a plan to replace them? And can you let us know? Okay, so at this time, um, 
I'm going to answer a few of your questions. Okay. Presently, NYCHA has a total of 16,566 cameras. This is across 207 developments, 1,443 buildings, and 1,984 total addresses. Okay, so, so out of those cameras, so all of those cameras currently are operating? At this point, I, can, I don't want to say that they're all operating because we have not went and asked staff to have a recent survey. However, I would like to explain to you what the process is at the property management level okay. for these small scale CCTVs that are in place. So property management is required, right, to have a designated individual check the system daily at the development location. So that is their responsibility. If for some reason there is a malfunction or perhaps there is an issue with the camera, they are responsible to put in a work order and that way our CCTV unit will address any repairs that are required. You, you said in a small scale? I'm sorry, yes, small scale TV. What I would like to do is I would like to have um, Raymond Rodriguez, who I, is our director of the Office of Safety and Security come up and he can explain to you a little bit more in depth about our CCTV cameras. Okay, that's perfect because those are my next line of questions to Mr. Rodriguez, so I'll just. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Okay. Before, you get to, before you answer that question, Mr. Rodriguez, give me a second. Okay, you can continue. Good morning. Um, basically, Raymond Rodriguez, as director of the Office of Safety and Security, I am responsible for the physical security, the CCTV unit, and the resident watch program, which all play a major part in the safety and security of our residents and their communities. Thank you again for your question. In regards to the life expectancy of the cameras, it's usually 10 years. Once a service call is made that something's not working properly, whether it's a camera or whether it's the infrastructure recording the, uh, the, the footage, basically we have 48 hours to basically correct that issue. And that's something that basically comes from my office, my team from CCTV. Okay. So you're responsible for protecting authorities, properties, employees, and residents. That is um, correct. Just so we can be like just clear and plain and simple, because everybody already know I just want to get right to the point. In my opening statement, I mentioned that an 83-year-old woman, Ms. James, was killed in Woodson houses, right? She was beaten to death in her apartment, and no one knows who killed her. 83-year-old Woodson houses. And so I would like to know if this office is in place and all of the work that you've done related to cameras over the past 20 years, how does, a, how does an 83-year-old woman get killed in her apartment? And no one knows who killed her. And before you answer that question, I also want to state that in the same building, a couple of years prior to that, an 84-year-old woman was killed in her apartment. Same exact building. So can you, so in order for us to understand what NYCHA is doing related to safety and security and layered access doors and cameras and lighting, can you explain to me how this happened? in order to better understand the work that you do. Understood. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a very unfortunate. And, and the reason why I said the yeah. same building Correct. is because I need for you to explain that two years later, like were there cameras installed, were the, you know, like just 
explain to us the process and what you do. Okay, like I mentioned before, it's a very unfortunate incident. Heart goes out to their families. Okay, our goal in our department is basically to ensure the safety and security of all our residents is basically paramount. Uh, regarding the question, uh, unfortunately, there are no cameras to this day over at Woodson. So basically, uh, that's something that we have already gotten pricing and so forth and so on, basically, to put the infrastructure into the development with additional camera resources, and that's where we're at at this point in time. So this is a senior building? That How is many correct. seniors live in that development? I don't have the total numbers, but we will get back to you on that. Okay, somebody could find that out. Um, and Carter, so the Woodson houses where this woman was murdered two years ago, and then Ms. James was murdered May 1st of this year, right? Two years lapsed and there was still no cameras. So explain to me how that happens and what's the process for like, um, the, is there's a level of urgency or like an expedited process of getting cameras to a development where you know that a senior was murdered and this development, this building, is directly across the street from a map site from Van Dyke Houses. Okay. So, so basically at this point in time, we are expediting to get something in place as soon as possible regarding the cameras at that location. Okay. Excuse me, council member. Um, thank you for your question. Um, again, it was a sad situation as to what occurred. You know, our hearts go out to the family and it was a very unfortunate situation. I would like to emphasize that safety is an issue that the New York City Housing Authority, we take very seriously and we are working together collaboratively with the NYPD and Mock J to deter crime wherever possible. But at this time, regarding your questions relating to you know, the instances, I would like to refer your question over to PD so that way they could perhaps provide more insight if they have additional information on what may have occurred. Thank you. Want to talk about the investigation? That's called the punt. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Chairman Richards. Uh, there are two uh, homicides in that building, 393 Powell uh, Street. Um, they're both under investigation, and uh, you know I can't really uh, speak much to that, but uh, they are under active investigation. And uh, we have beefed up our uh, coverage of those uh, that, that address uh, as you know, in regards to uh, you know, in response to these, to the, la the latest incident for sure. Uh, that building had not particularly been a problem uh, for us as a senior building, and uh, it, it, there's not much crime there normally, but uh, that's an egregious uh, crime nonetheless, and we've beefed up our security. In coordination with the 73 Priest and the Chief Madry, we've got together, put together a plan for uh, safety at that building going forward. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Um, can you speak to the work um, that falls under your department related to um, resident watch and uh, like what is that? And um, is there someone that can speak to tenant, I'm gonna end my questions there. Um, uh, tenant patrol, if that falls under you or if that even exists. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, basically, the uh, resident watch program does fall under our department. Uh, basically, at this point in time, we're rec our recruiting efforts continue. Uh, and in addition to that, basically, we're trying to also recruit youth as well who are actively uh, interested in keeping their communities safe. In addition to that, uh, there is no resident watch at the uh, Woodson houses. Let me correct that. I just got the answer for the total residents at Woodson. It's 433 residents 
at that location. Okay, I'm actually gonna um, start with my questions um, so that my um, co-chair can get to his questions. Um, I, I have a ton of other questions, but um, can you repeat the number again of seniors that live in Woodson? 433rd, 33. 433 seniors. So I just wanted to highlight the fact that that's not a small building, right? And even if it was, it's still um, a serious issue. And, um, you know, clearly, if you have two brutal murders of an 83-year-old and an 84-year-old in a development, and it's directly across the street from a map site, um, there's something that we should be doing and should not have taken two years. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop and yield over to my co-chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, so let, let's start with um, one question, and this is going to go to Chief Secreto first. Um, how often does the NYPD conduct security assessments of NYCHA developments? No outbursts, please. We're just trying to get information. So how often do assessments get made, NYCHA? Uh, do you request assessments from NYPD as well, or do you do your own security assessments as well? And if so, whom in NYCHA? would be a part of that. Thank you, thank you, council member, for that question. My office does conduct security and safety assessments at the developments during the entire year on a yearly basis. Um, and how, how many people are in your department? At this point in time, the actual people that go out and do the assessments are usually about 12 individuals. So 12 individuals go out and do assessments. assessments of every development in New York City. That is correct. On a, on a cycle. No outbursts, please, please. On a cycle. What is, what is the cycle? Basically, we would conduct approximately 40 within a quarter, 40 developments. And that also is in addition to the uh, consolidations as well. Let me ask you a question. So they, they go out, and, and who gets this information on the assessments? We pass on all the discrepancies over to the property manager, and then it is escalated to the borough management to put in work tickets and get these issues rectified. Uh, is there any transparent, uh, so can I go online right now and search anywhere about assessments made at any specific uh, developments in the city right now. Does the public have access um, to these assessments? I believe they don't. I believe they don't. They don't. But so the assessments will go to the property managers and the property managers jobs are, are, say that again? I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, basically it's all, it's all documented and it's in-house. So okay. it's available if let's say for example the residents wants wants to reach out and find out what their, what <laughs> All their right. issues I'm are. going to stop you there. Okay. Um, so I think the first step is to ensure that we have a transparent mechanism that ensures the public, and forgive me once again, I really am in a lot of pain today, so I'm going to sound a little weird, but the pain that residents are going through and nothing that, that I'm certainly enduring at this moment. Um, so there's no public uh, transparent measures for us. So if the, can the city council gain access to uh, all of these assessments? Is there any mechanism for that to happen? So if we request an assessment for every development in New York City, can you get that information readily available within 24 hours? Not at this point. Not at this point. We Once that information is, so we're, we're gonna request that by the way, so let me put that on the record. Um, we are interested in seeing every assessment uh, for every development in New York City. Um, so we would appreciate that information uh, being made available to us. Um, so then that information is passed on to um, the property manager, you said? Correct. Whose job it is to put in a ticket. Correct? Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. We're on the record now. Yes. Are we sure that every property manager is putting in tickets? No outbursts. At this point in time, I would have to get back to you on that. And you're in charge of security for NYCHA? That is correct. Okay. 
Um, I will just say in my own dealings with property managers, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, I'm not saying all of them are bad, but certainly I often find that the property managers have no idea what the heck is going on at their own developments. Um, so are we sure that property managers are actually walking around every day? And I'm not even sure whether we need an assessment made by some specific unit every day. If property managers are walking around and checking the doors, they would know if they are locked. So if I went to Redfern Houses in Far Rockaway today and I checked every door, are we positive that every door is locked? Okay. Council member, thank you for your question. I would like to provide some response. No, 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 I want him to answer. Okay. He's in charge of security. At this, at this point in time, I know that uh, Redfern is under construction. I don't, I don't want the political answer. I'm saying today, are you confident? Forget construction, forget NYCHA, forget Redfern. Don't forget Redfern. But are you positive that every developer in, in New York City right now has a door that is locked? We can't confirm that the doors are locked, but they are doing daily assessment of the doors. No, no. At, okay. this, at this point in time, I cannot confirm that, but they, okay. the property management normally has been assigned to do daily assessments regarding doors, entryways, okay. anything on their property. Okay, but you're not confident that that's happening? And what's the checks and balances in them reporting to you that every door is locked, that every camera is working? Who would oversee the process of ensuring the cameras are actually functioning? That, that would be the property manager. <laughs> and then it All right. Okay. Let me, let me, like, let me go, because I, I think you're, you're yeah, you're adding a lot. I think 12 people is a deficient amount of individuals to oversee all of security assessments for NYCHA. I probably know the answer to this. I know it's not happening. Um, I also want to know, um, so how often, and it goes back to Chief Secreto, how often, so when these assessments are made, is NYPD there? I would like to respond, if, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay, thank you. So. In response to your question regarding the daily inspection of doors, property managers and superintendents, right, are responsible daily for ensuring that their staff conduct. We have um, a form, a checklist, called the Supervisor of Caretakers Daily Checklist. Our, ma our staff are responsible for checking the doors daily. If they find that a door is open, it is their responsibility to notify their supervisor and put a, a request that the supervisor put a work order in for the repair of that door. Once that work order goes in, the maintenance worker is required to inspect the door. If they're able to repair the door, they will make that repair. If they are unable to ma make the repair, then they will have to refer that door to a vendor and have that door repaired. Councilman, I would also like to give you some data regarding some of the inspections that were done. According to um, our data, we have a total of 62,625 work orders that were created in the past 12 months from June the 18th to May 2019. Those were for public space doors. As of May 31st, we have a total of 2,582 work orders that are open. I would like to be very clear that those work orders that are reflected as being open, those work orders reflect our public space doors as well as our front entrance and our rear exit doors. So the total throughout the city is 2,582 as of the date that this report was run. And I would also like to inform you also that during meetings that I have as a vice president with the borough directors, one of the topics that we normally talk about on our agenda is the checklist, the daily checklist, the safety and security as ensuring that when these work orders are being made for both doors and intercoms at our staff that they're following up and they're making the repairs as, quiet, as required. Can I sit here today and say every door is locked? No, I cannot do that. But I can tell you that it is our procedure that our staff check the doors every day. 
Did I receive confirmation that our staff are performing the daily checklist? Yes, I did reach out to our department directors and I asked them to verify that the staff are ensuring that they are performing the caretaker's daily checklist daily. All right, so I think that's daily for today, but I'm saying every day where who, so you would get, so they, so managers would check the list and then who would get that information? Would it go to him? No, it does, okay. the, the, the repair of the doors are the responsibility at the local level. So the okay. manager and superintendent are responsible for creating work orders and also sending a maintenance worker. If the maintenance worker cannot fix the door, then it is the property manager's maintenance supervisor's responsibility to follow up to procure a contractor in order to do that work. Okay, I want, I want to move from this question I, because my question was not answered. How many times, when, so when these assessments are made, are NYPD, is NYPD there when assessments are done? No, they are not. And why would they not be included in security assessments for NYCHA housing? Can you clarify that the daily checklist is separate from the assessments that your department performs? And then what do you do with those things? Okay, I'm gonna, because I don't want answers created, but the, the point of this hearing is for us to think things through and to make it better so that residents f can feel safe. And I find it troubling, <laughs> I won't say the word I really think, that the NYPD would not be on grounds with you um, when assessments are being made. Um, let me go back to Chief Secreto for a second. I mean, being that I know now that NYCHA does not request your presence at assessments, um, does, does, your, does the NYPD ever make recommendations uh, where cameras or lighting should be placed? Yes, yes, uh, Councilman. We uh, we do make recommendations. As a matter of fact, I think when these cameras were, I think they were recently upgraded. The small scale, the CCTV cameras were upgraded. The uh, the uh, NYCHA and the commander of those PSAs went out and uh, decided where the, they should be placed. Well, they were already placed initially, but uh, if they had any changes to be made the commander of the PSA was uh, was there as well. But originally you weren't brought in at the beginning of the No, I, I, I believe the commanders of the PSAs had say in where, where the cameras were placed. Okay, let's stay with you for a second, Chief. So over the last decade or so, um, violent crime has decreased uh, across uh, the city. Um, can you say the same for NYCHA? Where are we at with NYCHA now? Yes, uh, we, in NYCHA, we have pretty much mirrored the, the decline that the city has had, that the city has uh, enjoyed. Uh, for example, index crime, and, uh, and I'll go back uh, to 1995, which uh, the patrol does when they talk about crime. We had 10,836 crimes. In 2018, we have 4,671 crimes. That's the fourth lowest number in those, uh, in those years that we've been recording uh, index crimes. Murder. In 1995, we had 115. In 2018, we had 41, which again was the lowest number, a recorded number that we had. And uh, shootings. In 1995, we had 340. Last year, we ended with 144. And uh, that was again the lowest number, recorded number that, we, uh, that we've had. And in uh, the three years, uh, the three preceding years, 16, 17, and 18, we reduced the number of murders and shootings each year to record lows. And last year, we ended with that record low, 144. Uh, but with that being said, this, this January, we got off to a, to a horrendous start. It was uh, 10 murders and 15 shootings. And we've been trying to catch up ever since. With that being said, May, we had eight shootings in May and two murders. Uh, lowest numbers, uh, well, the eight shootings were the lowest number in May in, uh, since we've been recording the numbers again. So we're, we're going in the right uh, direction. We've uh, deployed uh, officers in our hotspots uh, where, where we've seen uh, upticks in, in violence. We've adjusted our uh, coverage and uh, we're, we're making some strides. But Brooklyn North, and I, and I appreciate and I have a great uh, debt of respect for you and um, for the work that you do, certainly, um, day in and day out. Um, but the question I have is Brooklyn North has certainly been going off, 
right? I mean, we've seen murder after murder, um, seven-year-old shot last night, um, it seems protecting his grandmother, I think I read, read this morning. Um, so even with those numbers, and it sounds great, there are pockets of the city that feel under siege. Um, what strategies are the NYPD using um, to combat um, this feeling in the air that people can't sit outside again or you know, children can't play on the streets of Brooklyn? Okay, uh, Councilman, you're, you're right, uh, Brooklyn North, out of the 60 shootings that we have so far this year, uh, 21 are in Brooklyn North, so a third of the shootings are in Brooklyn North. But and were these at map sites or no? Uh, one of them is a map. No, I know Bushwick has one, Ingersoll has, okay. I think, two. So some of them are, are the map sites, but uh, they're pretty much spread out. Um, there's, uh, there's one development with three shootings. Which there's development seven developments. is that? That development is St. Nicholas. Okay. And uh, there's seven developments with two shootings. You, you want the names or no? So seven developments with two. And then there's like 43 with one. So there's uh, Coney Island, Ingersoll, Marcy, Morris, Queensbridge, Ravenswood, and Tompkins. They have two each. Okay. Let me, let me go to the NCO program for a second. So NCOs are tasked with doing community work, building bridges. Um, historically with communities that have not had a great relationship with the police department. Um, can you speak to what the NCOs are specifically doing at NYCHA housing? Uh, they're kind of tasked with doing everything. How, however, they, uh, and they are well trained. I think it was Ms. Bennett that alluded to. Uh, now they're not getting trained every day like she said, right? Because that could just be an excuse. Uh, that, I, and you can't blame the city council for regulating NCOs. <laughs> no, so, uh, so they so are, put that they are, on, you know, they are but, well trained. We send them, but to, they're not going every day, like not, she not said, every correct? Day, but they okay. are well trained, <laughs> and uh, you know, we use them for a lot. And they are, you know, they're kind of like uh, like community affairs, but more. So they are a, a, a task with uh, forging relationships with the community, with the pro uh, property managers. Certainly when there's an incident, they're uh, out there looking at uh, the cameras and identifying uh, perpetrators. And they, they also solve crimes that in years past would not, would not get solved because nobody would speak to the police. Uh, people feel more comfortable uh, giving them information. They also, like I said, they do these extended video canvases where they look at cameras uh, for blocks and blocks and they're able to identify uh, people involved. They're just kind of like, uh, and, and they, they are also tasked with problem solving. So we took a, a look at the uh, neighborhood staff meeting, and, and some of the things that came out of that meeting was, was uh, and I think again, Ms. Bennett alluded to the fire department breaking the doors. Uh, that came up at one of these meetings. The collection of the, of the garbage came up at one of these meetings. And those NCOs are, are part of the, the problem solving mechanism. So one of the things, Polar Grounds, again, uh, the, it came out at one of these meetings that people were parking their cars on the grounds. Now, back in the days that you also alluded to in your remarks about the heavy-handed policing, we probably would have told some people, given some uh, 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 summonses. The officers went to the property manager and tried to identify who these people were to put parking on the grounds. So that was their first course of action, find out who owns the cars to get the cars moved. So not just right away towing people and giving them summonses. So that's the type of, of work that uh, the NCOs are doing and the type of work they're doing in collaboration with uh, NYCHA. Now let me talk about Comstat for a second. So I know we always see housing numbers. Are, are we doing a better job at breaking down by borough, um, you know, the specific de development so we can track, how do we track exactly what crimes are going on? And then that, that sort of is, is a segue for me going into um, summonses in NYCHA housing too. Um, in 2008, the NYPD housing PSA issued 8,388 summonses in NYCHA developments. Over 2,000 were criminal summonses. Uh, what was the most common offense for criminal summonses issued? And then if you can speak to how many arrests or summonses the NYPD issued for trespassing related offenses last year as well. My, my guess would be that they were marijuana related. And uh, still going after weed. What's that? 
I said, we still going after weed aggression. Oh, you, said, well, you said 2008, though, right? Okay, oh, two, okay. No, I said 2018. Okay, 2018. 2018. Uh, look, um, for, if, so if, huh? there were 8,388 summonses in NYCHA developments. Over 2,000 were criminal summonses. Okay. Uh, 218. I have... I have uh, 3,132 C summonses in 2018. Can you just speak to what that what and, that means? And as far as that was a criminal court summonses, so more than more than likely they're marijuana. I'm gonna look here. So that was two. What was the number? 18, 2018. We had 19, 1,919 marijuana uh, summonses, and that's and that was all, all over that's marijuana. That's all nine uh, PSAs and and the response teams that we have. And that was. So out of the two, wait, so and C summons is ni over 1,900 for, yeah, if you could do So what's the summons? The summons are all broken down. Okay. All right. Those were arrests that I just gave you, the 1,900, the 1,919. So um, I can't speak to the, the summonses, but I'm, I'm hazarding a guess that they are ma largely marijuana related. <laughs> but, um, but now with that being said, you know, this year we're at 96. You're at 96. We're at 96. So, no, we're you know, it's, and that's arrest, marijuana related arrest. And were those, 96. would you attribute those marijuana arrests? You know, this is a subject I love to speak about. Uh, would you attribute that to um, violent crime or? Well, I, I mean, Council Member, let me just chime in for a second. I think this is the 1919 number was in 2018. I think what that captures is uh, a time prior to the adjustment of our policy, and you're, you, we worked with you on that, and you were aware of that during the process as we rolled it out. So uh, post uh, new policy relative to how we treat smoking marijuana in public, uh, we're down from the 1919 number, we're at 96 now, which means it met the criteria that was outlined in the, uh, in the new policy. So the numbers are, I mean, I think we would agree the numbers are down substantially. I mean, I think you, you're also aware of, you know, the conversation going on in Albany, and if there's an adjustment in the law, I think the numbers would wind up reflecting that as well. But at least now, uh, I think citywide, the number of summonses are down, I think, 90%. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me just say this. I would hope we're focusing our resources on violent crime offenders. You know, not the, and I, I know it's a quality of life issue. My seniors don't want to smell marijuana either. Um, but, you know, I would hope that resources are really being devoted to the developments that really need help. Um, you know, to, to go after issues that are serious, not, not somebody smoking weed on a bench. I, I, um, and, then I, and then I also w did not hear more about um, trespassing. So can you just speak to um, how many trespassing related arrest or summonses took place last year? That, that, that's way down as well. I'll, I'll get those numbers for you. But uh, uh, Councilman, I, I, if, I, if I may, Mm -hmm. You know, you, you spoke about um, the interior patrols uh, in your remarks. And, you know, that's, that's a big tool for us, not necessarily for arrest, but to, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, that people are doing the right things in the, in the buildings. So we have, you know, homeless situations, we have drug use, uh, we have uh, delivery men being robbed when they come to make a delivery. So there's different incidents, things are going on inside the buildings that need to be addressed. And having grown up in housing, I can tell you firsthand that if we knew the police were never coming in the building, we would have a field day when I lived there. So there has to be some presence of the police coming in and people having that fear that, hey, the cops could come through any minute. It's not designed, well, I can't speak to what it was designed for, but I can speak to what I want now. I don't want the menial arrest that, uh, that, that I guess you're talking about as far as marijuana and trespass, but with that being said, uh, we want to make sure that the, the building is safe for the people that live there. And um, I'm going to begin to wrap up. I'll come back for a okay. second round um, for my colleagues. Oh, can um, I just but, get you to trespass? Yeah. Uh, last year was 979, 
Mm -hmm. And this year so f is projected to be 580 at the end of the year. Okay, and I want to thank you. I think that's that's important work um, because we, like we've said earlier, we can't incarcerate our way out of these issues. Um, can you go through uh, misdemeanor arrests now? Um, in 2018, the PSAs made 10,665 arrests in NYCHA developments. 73% were misdemeanor arrests. Um, and then more than half of all of those arrests were just in four housing PSAs, PSA 4, 5, 7, and 8. Um, can you go through um, what are driving these arrests? And then I'm interested in hearing from Mock J and others before I, I come back for another round on what are the strategies um, being utilized around violent crime, uh, in particular around NYCHA housing. And I find, I mean, in your testimony, I think it was Mock J, you spoke of um, fifty thousand dollars, fifty thousand per development. Yeah. For, do you think that's enough? Or do we need more money for programs? Um, when you talk about fifty thousand dollars for MAP programs, it doesn't, in particularly, show to me, in my opinion, a real commitment on the administration's part um, to really have a full-blown program um, in public housing. I, I mean, I'm just. I want to use the example of Cure Violence, the crisis management system, for instance, which can be a real answer to, 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 going, to, to resolving crime in a whole, with a holistic approach. Um, how many of these PSAs, how many of these developments have um, the crisis management system wrapped around them? Um, because to me, that would be a, taking a more holistic approach in addressing crime. Um, but $50,000 to me is inadequate when you're talking about real programming um, and addressing crime in neighborhoods. So now I'm gonna end on those two things. I could come back, you can get back to me on misdemeanors. NYCHA, you heard, <laughs> uh, I'm not seeing a real plan right now. I'm not feeling like um, we are taking a true transparent and aggressive approach and making residents feel safe. No, we're not gonna put this all on the police department's doorstep, um, but it is your authority. And based on the answers that you gave me today, um, <laughs> you got a hell of a lot of work to make sure that um, <laughs> your managers are actually taking security seriously. Councilman, can I respond to your, your question? Now, we're down 2,000 uh, uh, arrests, 2,000 arrests. So we had 6,200 last year this time. We have 4,100 this year. And they're all misdemeanors, 2,000 less. What's the most common misdemeanor charge? Uh, I'm going to say I'm gonna say it's uh, either marijuana or trespass. <laughs> but, Councilman, if I may. <laughs> Go ahead. On April 20th in Mott Haven Development, we had a, we had a murder that emanated from guys uh, drinking and smoking marijuana in a, in a courtyard, and they rested the, the uh, liquor, the cups, on, on a 17-year-old's um, but that's, window that's, sill. But that's speculation at this moment. You know, I mean, and I get that I mean, murder. No, I, mean, I don't that, want to no, attribute that's a that fact. to marijuana. That's a fact. That's a right. fact okay. that that's okay. what this, this murder started over. Because right. But one murder out of all of these misdemeanors and summonses, if, if you're telling me that marijuana is the reason this 83-year-old no, no, died, no, no. no, I'm not saying not, that, sir. That's not the reason, right? No, I'm you not know? saying because they were drinking as well. Right. But, but the thing is, how do we know whether it was alcohol or weed? <laughs> What's that, sir? No, I'm saying, how do we know whether it was alcohol or weed that caused it? So I don't want to attribute. But I mean, C council member, yeah. if I could just, if mm -hmm. I could just add, I mean, I, I think we get your point, and we, we've kind of been through this topic through a number of hearings, and it seems to come up. And in response, what we did was we did redraft our policy. I think you would agree you see a significant decrease in the amount of enforcement. But it needs to be acknowledged, and I, I think you acknowledge it, and you've been, we've been to your, uh, to your district for uh, public safety town halls and forums, and I'm sure the residents that are here in the audience will tell you, there are issues that are raised to the police department uh, about smoking marijuana, about trespassing. There was a lady that testified in the first panel that talked about uh, people loitering in the, um, okay. in the, in the okay. hallways or in the stairwells and urinating in the stairwells. We need certain tools, and we clearly don't overuse those tools, but 
it is the law, nevertheless. The laws are on the books, and we need some mechanism right. to address and I, I get that, Oleg, but that's, that's not the issue. The issue is that you got broken doors, you have security system cameras that NYCHA doesn't even know if works. Um, <laughs> you know, there are a myriad of problems, and I'm not going to just associate it with marijuana. You know, that's besides the point. Um, if you have broken doors <laughs> that anybody could walk through at any time of the day, that's, that's, that's a gateway to, to a problem. And it's not, damn sure it's not weed. Um, and, and also, um, you know, the NYPD should be devoting its resources to more serious crimes. Um, so if we're spending all our time going after low-level marijuana offenders, um, that's, that's not the answer in my opinion. So I will come back for a second round. I do appreciate the work you've done on reducing the disparities, well, not disparities, but the numbers. Um, but we, we, there's no, it, to me, it seems like there's no clear strategy um, with NYCHA to blame first, but NYPD also, and uh, I would say playing a role here as well, a lack there of a role in a cohesive strategic plan um, coming together to do assessments together to address <laughs> issues around public safety and public housing. So I'll leave it at that, um, but we got a lot of work to do. Thank you, um, Council Member Antonio Reynoso. Thank you for your patience, and I know you do have to go to BNT. Thank you, thank you for that, Chairs. Um, it's just very important that I be here today because I represent Bushwick Houses, which was recently named the most dangerous development in the city of New York uh, in, a, in an article um, in some publication. I don't necessarily think it's the most dangerous development, um, but it's building a, a, a reputation um, that I'm not happy with, and I think that NYCHA the NYPD, the, uh, the admin has fell extremely short in trying to address the issues that we have in Bushwick houses across the board. Um, and I'm gonna start by saying I sponsor a basketball league every single year where I have about 160 kids uh, participate. And we've had to move it to a neighboring development because the parents don't want the kids playing outside. We have a softball field that hasn't had a permit for a softball game outside of a cops versus kids one time over the last seven years. So no, not one game in that ball field, brand new, uh, beautiful ball field. Um, there is a, a woman that was killed and then a neighbor who peeked out of the door to see what happened and also got killed. Um, we, don't have, we don't know who killed either of those um, folks. We have cameras everywhere in Bushwick houses and it doesn't seem like it means anything. Um, I've asked for, uh, and I would love to ask you guys, what, I feel like there's no coordination happening. Like what is, I wanted to ask, for example, uh, Secreto, uh, Chief, what is the city doing that is different in this development outside of MAP that they're not doing anywhere else? Do you know what the city is doing outside of MAP in this development in Bushwick Houses that is supposed to be the most dangerous outside of anywhere else? Do you know what they are doing? But, you know, I think uh, the mayor's office probably can add to, uh, to that question, but I know the, the Cornerstone uh, community centers are open, but that's, there's 119 of those, so it's not, to your, quest, to your point, it's not, it's not just yeah. a map. Uh, there's social services, there's resources, uh, you know, police resources, but again, to your point, we put resources where they're needed, whether it's map or not. So, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer to that is, uh, you know, other than... I guess what I'm saying is that you're just going to do what you do, and I don't think that that works, right? You can't just use uh, the similar protocols across the board to keep addressing issues the same way. There needs to be a targeted approach in certain developments that is, is different to try to get different outcomes. Because you guys all talked about the decrease in crime. That's not happening in North Brooklyn. In North Brooklyn, over the last three years, there's been an increase in crime. And what there hasn't been has been an increase in resources from the city to address those issues. We have a, now we have, uh, a, I call it a cure violence light because I've been asking for cure violence uh, for the last four years in Bushwick houses and the city has told me no. Uh, last year they gave me $100,000 instead of 50, so thank you very much, 100,000. Um, and then this year we fought again. After every single murder that happens, you guys give me another $50,000. That's how, that's how I see you guys talking to me about this issue. I don't think that's appropriate. 
I think we need to be proactive. I don't want to keep seeing one of my young people die, a young person that works, that lives in the development, plays basketball in my league, and also goes to the cornerstone, died in this development. And then I got another 50,000 for that. I don't think these kids' lives are worth 50,000 at a time. That's not acceptable. You need to have a comprehensive approach as to how you're gonna deal with this. To have a security person come in, do an assessment, give it to the property managers and never do any follow-up to see if his assessment was handled is, is just not good management. And I feel like it's amateur hour and I can't have Bushwick houses be run amateurly. It needs to be run professionally in order to deal with these issues. So what I'm asking today is we should get a cure violence light over there so that we could see a uh, cure violence, not a cure violence light, which is what I, um, so that we can have real resources come to these kids. I've asked for an expansion of the community center. Have you been to that community center? It's four or five classrooms and the smallest gym where you can't even take a jump shot. Um, in, in, and I've asked for that gym to be replaced and NYCHA told me no. I wanna be very clear, NYCHA said no. They won't expand the gym. I just want them to bust down a wall and expand it so that the kids could find that and for it could be an attractive place, they said no. The kids two years ago got promised by the mayor's office that they would get a recording studio because they said music is the thing that would attract the most kids to the community center. It's been two years, they still don't have a, community, uh, a recording studio. Now I have to put money out of my discretionary to pay for a promise that you made that you never committed to. So it's like you show up, you make commitments, you make promises, the kids and people keep dying in this development and you don't fulfill any of them. If you wanna deal with this, I want you to address the issues of the community center, put in real f um, funding and resources, and work coordinated, and I don't think that's happening. And I want to be clear, I don't want Chief to send me more cops. It's resources so these kids have options, and we don't have that. The Cornerstone program is just a, a step in the right direction, but it's just a drop in the bucket. We need triage, we need triage, and you guys need to go bring those resources. And right now, um, I'm just saying that because it, I feel very uncomfortable that I gotta move my kids from Bushwick houses to go play basketball in Williamsburg houses. And what that means to them, they lost the space. The children, there's no laughter in the playgrounds anymore. And I think we have, a, we were a part of that problem. And I've been saying this for four years. Another thing is that the Cornerstone site, the, the managers of the Cornerstone site left. They closed the Cornerstone site after a shooting and left to Williamsburg houses. And they didn't do any work for a week that, that place was shut down because they, were, they feared for their lives, right? And they were doing it as a protest, asking for the city to do more. Then they came back. But these kids that live in Bushwick houses, they don't get to close up. They gotta go back to Bushwick houses. They gotta deal with that. So you guys are falling extremely short. Stop giving me $50,000 at a time and throwing chump change at me. These kids deserve more. And it's, I just wanted to make more a statement than anything else. Um, we'd love for you to, to try to respond to this because um, if you think you could close the gap on what I've been dealing with locally, I would love to hear it. Um, I thank you for your question and I hear and I understand your concerns. I may not be able to answer some of your questions, but I would like to respond to a few of the questions that I may be able to respond. For the questions that I can't respond to, the Housing Authority will follow up and we will provide you with the response either today at a, or at a later time. I would just like to re-emphasize again that we at the New York City Housing Authority take safety and security of our residents and our staff very seriously. With that said, I would just like to kind of give you a little overview about Bushwick Houses, a few of the points. I don't believe we have any cameras there. NYCHA does not traditionally fund CCTV cameras at our development, so we're talking about safety and security. Once again, we manage property. We're responsible, as I mentioned before, for inspecting the doors and the intercoms. And I can say that our staff is responsible, that is our procedure, and the doors are being checked daily. Funding for CCTV systems- So, but do you say, you could check them daily. Are they, are they the working doors, right now? Yes, the doors are checked and repaired daily by, let me finish, by a maintenance worker. If they cannot be addressed by a maintenance worker, then it is our responsibility to obtain a vendor. Will the vendor be there the same day? No, the vendor will not be there the same day. So there may be doors that are open awaiting for staff to, in order to, again, we have to procure a vendor. But you're just, we, but you're just talking about protocols. Okay. The people living every day, they, don't, they can't deal with protocols. They have open doors every single day. So, so you, yeah, you got protocols. I got protocols in my office. If they're not working, it's for not. 
Res and right now we have a buildings that don't ha that have open doors. Respectfully so, I understand that. And I was just like to also say, we also deal with vandalism as well. Many times some of our doors are opened and sometimes the doors are not necessarily damaged, but there may be an object placed in the lock so sometimes when no we they're just open you could we could we could i would love for you guys so to go to bushwick houses and make an assessment walking with me but i want to say we went on a trip three years ago to new jersey to see these new modern ways of how we're going to deal with security in NYCHA where we're going to upgrade the lobbies have somebody in the lobby present like a security guard that will tell people when they can come in and can't come in that never came to fruition we have layered access that doesn't even that i don't know it doesn't even work if we have key fobs and they're supposed to work um, and we're supposed to have doors that are strong enough to not break down. I just, I just think it's amateur. Just we, we either got to do it or we don't. And, and this protocol that you're talking about, they've done, oh, they've always done this protocol. You're not telling me anything different than I've heard six years ago about how you're going to address safety. But what has happened in those last six years is an increase in crime, an increase in murders. My young people are dying. So I just feel like you need a different approach. I don't want to hear protocol anymore. Okay. Be creative. I, and I don't think that creative exists right now in NYCHA. Respectfully so, if you would just like me to make a few other points and I'll be... But let's get to the points then, sure. and, and okay, so, I I could, will. so I could go after So them. Bushwick Houses is a participant in the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety Map and an initiative led by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Mark J. The number of CCTV cameras at a development varies based upon availability of funds. When NYCHA receives funding for CCTV systems, it prioritizes our installation at front and back entrances. If there is sufficient funding, CCTV cameras may also be installed in elevators, on building exteriors, development, ground, so you're trying to tell me that you want landings. me to fund CCTV cameras for Bushwick Houses? Well, I'm, I'm mentioning that this is how CCTV cameras are funded. So if we can receive the funding in order to How many to buildings fund, are in Bushwick Houses? And then I want you to tell me how much it costs for me as an individual council member that gets $5 million a year to, put it, to, put, to give to my entire community related to parks, schools, libraries, NYCHA. I handle all that. How much is one building worth of CCTV cameras? And then I want you to tell me how many buildings are in Bushwick Houses. And then I want you to tell me how much it costs okay. and how you're going to put. And then I want to talk so, about. Uh, Donovan Richards has how many buildings are in Redfern? 15 buildings, and you want him to, to install cameras in Redfern? So the council members that have NYCHA developments in their district have a burden to provide cameras for you. And if you have no, oh. if you have no NYCHA in your development, you could put them to parks, you can make the schools look nicer, you can fix libraries, but we have to deal with safety. I'm sorry, councilman, I'd just like to make a correction that previously Bushwick Houses has received $4.56 million in investments for new lighting, CCTV cameras, and layered access controls, and I believe that you did fund that, so we thank you. So, so wait a minute, but first they said we didn't fund, and then they find out I gave $4.5 million. My problem is not that. My problem is that it's just the same. My, I feel bad that I gave the $4.5 million to you for cameras. I should have given it to the community center so we could expand the gym so the kids could do better. What I'm saying is I don't think we're talking. There's not enough communication, coordination going on to address this issue. And I feel like I'm doing it alone with my community and that there's not enough help. It's a crisis in Bushwick, and I'm, I hope you hear my urgency. Yeah. And I don't even want to, I, I just feel uncomfortable hearing because you're not going to give me solutions. You're just going to talk about what you do, and I don't like what you do. Thank you. Any other your concerns I would ask if you could please intervene? I, I wanna, Thank you. First, I want to say I, I appreciate your passion and your frustration, and I respect it. That's number one. Um, Councilmember Richards asked earlier about the $50,000, you brought up $50,000, and I can say, um, as a person who grew up in a low-income housing situation, who knows what it's like mm -hmm. to sleep up against mold, to have bullets come through your window, mm -hmm. there is no amount of money that I could say that these folks deserve. They deserve the world, and we understand that. But the comments, the comments that we are not doing anything um, new or different or not coordinating, I don't feel that that um, gives the due respect to the work that people are trying to do. Doing something new is empowering people to change the narrative in their community, to own their spaces, to be able to speak out against violence, to come out in the community and say, this is our space and we own it. That is something new. And, you know, we are, there's always more that we can do. And we are trying to do that. And we are committed to doing that. And we're happy to meet with you, to meet with the community, to continue to talk, to continue to advocate. But you can't deny, and I, and I hear you. Like, I have, we have um, the, map, the, the, yeah. the MAP program and the, and the WIC that these guys right here wearing the blue Absolutely. shirts that we have. 
They know what we need. But you know what they're doing right now? They have to go to, um, uh, what do you call those? Uh, vigil after vigil after vigil after vigil. They don't got time to organize these other events. And well, you Absolutely. know what? If we it's give them so twice as much money, and they got twice as many people doing that work, then maybe they, half of them could plan vigils, unfortunately, and the other half could plan events for the community. That's what I'm saying. It's just like, it's not working, and I don't feel like we're thinking about it. You, I feel like you're just trying to keep me quiet. That's not true. And doing enough. So, so then let's, let's sit down. Let's sit down. Let's have a comprehensive plan. Talk to these kids in the Cornerstone program. Think about infrastructure, too. The, the building is a mess. The, the community center is, is not a, a high-quality environment for these kids. Williamsburg Houses has a beautiful facility, but we shouldn't have to run away to that beautiful facility every time we have a problem. We should have our own spaces that are meaningful. And NYCHA shouldn't say no to anything. They should be open to the possibility of expanding community space if it, if it could mean the difference between saving a kid's life or not. I think that's the beauty of this program, and I agree with you, that all of these people now have a place where they can talk directly to government. But I'm, I'm, I meant the folks in this room. I hear you. I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm just saying yes. I hope you heard me because I think for a long time I've been talking, talking to a wall. And I feel like hearings are great because I get to come at you and you, this is public now. So people know what I've been trying to do behind closed doors. Absolutely. Now you see it out in the open. So thank you. Majority Leader Lori Combo. Thank you. Just want to know, is there, and I apologize because we have a, a budget negotiation meeting downstairs. Is there someone here from NYCHA that's uh, head of capital, that understands the capital budget, that's head of capital programs here? Yes. That's you. Remind me of your name again. My name is Stephen Lovesey. I'm a senior advisor on capital. Do you have someone who is the actual director of capital programs at NYCHA? Is, does that person exist on staff? Yep. Um, and who would that be? That's Deborah Goddard, the EVP of capital, um, who has testified um, previously, unfortunately due to uh, schedule conflicts, could not be here today. Okay, I would like on the record, because we have asked NYCHA for a capital meeting in my office, and they have consistently sent low-level staffers who are completely unaware of the capital process, who are reading on their phone talking points to answer questions that they're not able to answer. And we had a meeting with Walt Whitman, Ingersoll, Farragut, Lafayette Gardens, as well as Atlantic Terminal to discuss the capital needs in my office, and a low-level staffer was sent, not low-level in terms of intellect, but low-level in terms of this person is not empowered to be a decision maker, nor do they understand the complexities of uh, the capital budget as it pertains to NYCHA. So I'm asking on the record here um, this month we want to have a meeting um, with your capital director as well as yourself to discuss capital needs in my development. We'll definitely make that happen, um, and we'll do that through our intergov. And that's a commitment in this month. And we will make that happen this month. Thank you. My second question goes into the security dynamics um, in terms of NYCHA. So um, my constituents have eloquently and fought very hard for improvements to our basketball courts, our playgrounds, our handball courts, areas where our youth um, are in desperate need for education, activity, the ability to come together, but we have gotten pushback in terms of saying that these are not high-level priority items um, and that they are not being pushed through because of other capital needs. What is the timetable? Because in any real security plan, you have to have spaces where the youth can actually play, where children can go on a playground, where young people can have basketball tournaments. But if those facilities are not available to them, particularly during the summer, we have a huge challenge on our hands. Yep, I understand your question, and thank you very much for it. Um, as you know, and you've been at the Capitol hearings in regards to the overall budget for the capital program. Um, city funds are allocated to particular items. Right. And the federal funds are focused on 
uh, taking care of heating plants, boilers, roofs, uh, the exterior of the building, and focusing on the residents' uh, buildings themselves, grounds, and other um, pieces. There is funding associated to those, but it is not as much as heating plants, steam plants, gas risers, those infrastructure pieces that are very important to the residents' uh, daily lives in their homes. We are teaming up with other agencies, and we are working um, with the council who have given us discretionary funds in the past to do playground upgrades and other ground improvements, and we always appreciate those funds, and those can be allocated to those particular uh, upgrades. I believe um, we did a dance studio at Atlantic Terminals that turned out really well, and we thank you very much for the funding that you provided that resident, um, that community center, and I believe that that program is uh, been a great one for the community. It has been a great one. However, there was a flood there, and now the dance studio is buckled. And so the, the young people actually can't utilize it in the same way. So I thought that was a good step in the right direction, that the, those resources were put forward for the dance studio. But I, I'm unaware of how the space is being utilized since the flood happened. OK, I will look into that. OK. My second question goes into, and I, and I just want to add, we provide out of our capital budgets, as Council Member Reynoso said, we provide each council member so that you know each council member gets about, I'll say, $4 million in capital that they have the power to allocate within their own district. So if we give a million or two million to our NYCHA developments, that decreases the amount that we're able to put into schools, parks, infrastructure, all of these different things that we want to improve so many other things. But if we're giving you our capital dollars to do basketball courts, to do those renovations, and you sit on that money, then it is for no use for the entire community. Nobody actually gets to benefit from it. So we need, most of us here have two and a half years left. And I am not leaving without these capital improvements being made to my district. My residents deserve it. They fought hard for it. Our young people deserve it. This is the least of what we can do to keep them safe in their communities. So I, I wanted to touch on one other aspect. This came up during a meeting. It seems like it's a, it's a game where everyone says it's the other person. The issue of people breaking into NYCHA developments sleeping in the hallways, sleeping in the stairwells, setting up basic, you know, this is someone's setting up a home in the stairwells. And it happens time and time and time again. Um, the PSA 3s say that it has everything to do with uh, the Department of Homeless Services. Department of Homeless Services says it has to do with the police department. Then it has to do with NYCHA and there, I mean, Whatever's happening, the same situation continues to happen. It's most persistent in Atlantic Terminal, as well as Lafayette Garden in my district, and many of the other developments. So can you speak to what is the real plan to address this? Because nowhere else in the city of New York would people tolerate people setting up a home in someone's stairwell and lobby and creating such an unsafe environment for children, for seniors, for families. I mean, there has to be a serious plan around this. That, that does fall on the police department as uh, homeless services as well, because we don't want to arrest someone that's homeless. So usually we team up with homeless services and uh, we find some uh, resource or shelter or whatever and remove them from the building. Who removes them? The police department and uh, homeless services. So, but we have, you know, have, we have to know specifics. And that's another uh, thing that interior patrols would come across. If someone homeless uh, in Atlantic Terminal or Ingersoll or wherever, uh, once we go in the building and see who's in there and get them out. But we, you know, we certainly don't want to arrest them, um, but we want to... What if that individual broke into an apartment on Park Avenue and set up their home there? What would be the... How would that be viewed in the same way? Let me tell you, because, and I'll tell you why. I, when we campaign to run for office, we have to door knock in different developments. Some you can get in, 
some you can't. But when I go on the other side of Myrtle Avenue and I go into some of those fancy high risers, they called the police on me. And the police were ready to arrest me for knocking on someone's door in one of those developments. Hmm? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I had to talk my way out of it. Sure, so <laughs> council member, I think, uh, I mean, I think what, what the chief is trying to say, and I think that what the position of the department is, and this happens in, indoors as well as outdoors, uh, we have a homeless population, and what we try to do, rather than creating criminal records for them, is to, to link them up with some type of a service, whether it be a shelter or some other type of service that they need. With that being said, unlike the being out in the street sitting on the bench or or just basically out on the sidewalk when you are in a building and you have no right to be in the building that is a crime in new york right and that's we do have that tool i mean we'll of course try to connect somebody that's without a home to proper services to the best of our ability to do that we have a homeless outreach unit that partners up with Department of Social Ser Department of Homeless Services, and uh, we go out together and we try to connect these folks with the proper services. If that fails, if we ha if we have a situation that somebody is in a NYCHA building in the stairwell setting up home in in the stairwell, they don't have a right to be there. And if our ability, if our efforts to connect them with some type of shelter or some type of service fails, and we find them in there, we do have the ability to arrest. Unlike unlike the street, unlike being on the sidewalk. Let me say, this is a very sensitive issue. I'm extremely sensitive to the issue of homelessness, and I understand that more often than not, the people that are homeless look just like me and my family. So I get it, and I understand it. But at the same time, it creates an unsafe environment to allow people to sleep in stairwells, as well as lobbies, as well as hallways. It just creates such an unsafe environment, and it can't just be that we look at this as a low-income community of color, you know, and, and let me tell you, there are many individuals in the development that sympathize with the individuals that are sleeping there, but we can't continue to have this type of dynamic fester because it creates such an unsafe environment. Everyone here on this panel would not tolerate for two seconds that type of dynamic in their living situation. I know I would not be able to live comfortably having a son that's two years old and there's somebody sleeping in the stairwell as we're trying to get up and through to go to school every morning. So I wanna see a real plan of action that's, that really takes this situation into consideration and understands that unfortunately we have to be tougher on this issue. I can't have my seniors afraid to go outside of their homes because they don't understand what's gonna happen to them when they wanna go downstairs and check their mail or pick up their grandchildren. They shouldn't have to live in that type of fear. Uh, yeah, and just just to clarify, what, I, what I'm not saying is that when an officer approaches and tries to offer services and if the person says no, rejects the services and says, well, I'll just stay here because I'm comfortable here. That's not the solution. We're not walking away from that and saying, well, then you can stay there. Uh, we're gonna address the issue. So if we can, we can solve it, I mean, that is neighborhood policing, is to try to resolve issues without necessarily jumping straight to enforcement, right? So if we can do that, if we could connect somebody with services, if we can resolve the issue, whether it be through NCOs, through homeless outreach, or through uh, housing cops or regular precinct cops, if we could address the situation without taking enforcement, with helping somebody, connecting them to resources, that's clearly what we want to do. However, if that fails, if the individual does not want the services and simply wants to stay in the stairwell and set up camp and they don't live in the building, that is not a solution that is acceptable to us. They cannot stay there. We do have, unlike in, on the streets and the sidewalk where a person has the right to be there, you don't have an automatic right to set up camp in a housing in a NYCHA stairwell, much like you said, nor do you have the right to set up camp in a Park Avenue apartment building. So much like the Park Avenue building, the NYCHA building's the same. It's open to residents of the building, it's open to their guests, clearly, but it's people can't just go in there and decide to live in the stairwell. 
I appreciate your comment and I appreciate your response, but I mean, even as you're speaking, it's just something that was brought up earlier, just what you're saying, you provide those services, but what my residents and TA leaders continue to tell me is, they come right back. So you may do all that you're saying that you're doing, but the next t tenant leader meeting I have, they say they came right back. And so it's like, I wanna have meetings with my TA leaders, but they're like, what's the point? Why do we keep coming to meet with you every month? And the same issues are, are the same issues. What are you actually doing? directing it to me, and so I have to direct that to you. I mean, the truth of the matter is, this security system that is within NYCHA is non-existent. I mean, in any normal society, you would have regular security patrols, you would have surveillance cameras that people are actually looking at, you would have doors that actually lock and stay locked, you would have all of these different sorts of things, but we kind of do it in this, like, how would you say, like, you're not on the offense, you're always on the defense. You're not offensively having people that walk the grounds, walk the stairwells. You have a police department that does what's known as verticals, but verticals aren't a security plan for thousands of people living in a particular development. It's just, it's really unfortunate that we're leaving a community of people so vulnerable any building that had the lack of security that our NYCHA developments have would be grounds for an unsafe community and environment. NYCHA residents are not more prone to violent acts than any other community. It's just that there is no security present at all. And that's what festers this. That's really what the system of broken windows was actually supposed to be created upon. When you leave environments, not people, in disarray, broken windows, lobbies not clean, people sleeping in the stairwells. It creates an environment of festering of violence. And that's really what we have to address. Yeah, and I think I, I, I agree with you. And I think the, the point of trying to connect somebody with services rather than simply taking enforcement, because we can do that. And to your point, the residents will tell you that well, they may have taken enforcement and he or she left, but they're back the next day and they keep coming back. If we connect them, if we're successful in connecting an individual to the proper service, then maybe they won't be back the next day. Maybe we, they will, we will find them some sort of housing. We will find them a place to go where it resolves the issue long term rather than the quick fix. Because an arrest is certainly an option, right? Y you will take somebody out of that stairwell in that moment, eventually they're not going to be imprisoned forever. They're going to be let out probably within 24 hours or less. And if all they're doing is coming back, all we're doing is we're part of this vicious cycle of arrest, come back, arrest, come back, arrest, come back. So what we're trying to do is go out of the box. That's, and you've spoken to the police commissioner many a times, that's what neighborhood policing is, is to go out of the box to try to figure out solutions that are non-enforcement solutions to the extent possible or practicable, and to try to do that, and that generally results in a longer term solution of placing that individual in a home somewhere, and then they no longer come back to the stairwell, and you're, you're, you're dealing with the issue individual by individual and trying to play that long term solution. But if not, and as I said to you, and as I'm saying to the residents here, if there's an individual that's in a stairwell in NYCHA, much like any other building, high-end buildings on Park Avenue, we have a penal law tool of arresting the individual for, for, for being in a building when they don't have a right to be there. And that's certainly a tool that we have. The idea is to solve it longer term, and we're gonna do our best to do that, uh, but we, also, we always have that tool. Uh, I just wanna charge you all to do that because as elected officials, we have to think about the schools, the libraries, the churches, the house of worships, DOT, we gotta think about our NYCHA developments, we gotta think about the arts, funding, pay parity. This is your lane. And while you're in that lane, and this is really the main issue that you have the ability and the time and the space and the resources to focus on, let's get to those long-term solutions. Thank you so much to both my co-chairs, thank you. Thank you, and I know that Councilwoman Ayala has to also go back to B&T, so Ayala followed by Councilmember Jonah. 
Thank you. And thank she you. Was, she was actually on the list before you were. <laughs> you got here late, Mark. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I just, I wanted to, rather than share my testimony, to read to you some of the concerns, some of the, uh, the incidents that have occurred in my district in the last six weeks. So actually a little bit longer than that, because in April, early April, we had a 15-year-old that was shot in the face while walking through Patterson houses. May 21st, I had uh, an incident at Wagner houses where over 50 young people were involved in some sort of gang violence where they, I mean, they were literally beating each other up. One of the kids that was coming out of his building, minding his own business, was actually the victim of whatever was transpiring in front of the building. He was beat up and hit over the head with a metal pipe. Uh, all of these are non-fatal. Uh, had shots fired at Jefferson houses on May 18th. Female slashed in the face May 22nd. It was actually a 76-year-old female who was approached by a 40-year-old who inquired about her granddaughter having been in a fight the day before and slashed the 76-year-old across the face. East River Houses, May 26th. Uh, we had two people shot, one fatally. May 28th, male non-fatal shot at Johnson Houses. June 2nd, um, at East River Houses, I had uh, another male slashed. Just yesterday, I had a seven-year-old shot in the leg at Millbrook Houses, and last week, I had a woman, 20-year-old, um, that was brutally raped at Mitchell Houses on the roof. And I wanna read to you, this is just an example, there were more. I actually didn't have time, believe it or not, to print them, but I'm happy to do that because I believe that I requested a meeting with both NYCHA and NYPD to talk about the public safety situation in my district. So I just wanted to give you an example of what my constituents are living through each and every single day. I represent the most public housing of any other council member on this body, and this is what we live through. We live in fear, so much so that I don't even allow my own children to frequent the local playground because I don't know that my kid is gonna make it home that night. And I am responsible not just for my children, I am responsible for the children of every other constituent in that district. So it's a lot that I have to go to sleep with every single night. It is a responsibility that nobody should have to bear with. There is no reason why anybody's child should be walking through whether you live in public housing or not and not make it home that night. I wanted to read this to you because we, we, you know, we, we talk about all of the money that we put into MAP, and there's a lot of money in my community. There's a lot of, there are a lot of resources. It's not by lack of resources. We have them. We're not coordinating them effectively. Nobody's measuring success. Nobody's coming back to see if they work, but they exist. They exist. And so I want to read to you one of, this is, a, this is actually from the executive director at the Wagner Cornerstone who wrote a letter to DYCD in response to something that occurred at that Cornerstone. Um, back in October, and this is a, a development that is also the recipient of a MAP program. So he writes, I'm not gonna say to who, but he writes, I write this to you this morning after one of the East Harlem Cornerstones, Wagner, was literally shot up the evening of 1023. Only weeks ago, a number of Taft Johnson young men and, uh, were brandishing baseball bats outside of our Clinton and Lehman Cornerstones. The significant youth violence in East Harlem is growing incrementally, despite the comparatively recent incarceration of approximately 150 young men from Wagner, East River, Johnson, and Taft. This violence is burgeoning despite our East Harlem-based Cure Violence Program initiative. This violence spreads despite the Manhattan DA's Office Hub initiative and related collaborative funded projects. Our Wagner Cornerstone violence is spreading despite MAP efforts to offer supportive initiatives, for example, SYEP slots. When one recognizes the substantial extra added efforts focused on our East Harlem community, the significant failure of these efforts needs to be mindfully considered, understood, and serve as a lesson moving forward. And that is, that's a deep message um, because he's absolutely right. If we're investing all of these resources, who the heck is coming back to determine whether or not they're actually working. There's no reason why at a MAP site we should see violence continue to grow or stagnate when all of these resources are supposedly being poured into it. And if it is the fact that, th that these numbers are growing, because my understanding is that NYPD is only um, monitoring for the seven major crimes, but so when I've asked, I'm like, who's measuring success? What are the outcomes? Well, we've only had one fatality at this development. Really, is that how we measure success? Because we have one fatality? So the people that got shot 
and made it don't count. The people that were slashed and made it don't count. The kid that was beat up with a pipe doesn't count. The, 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 the kid that was riding around on national night out on a city bike with a handgun on him looking for somebody to kill that night, that doesn't count. Those incidents make up what we're seeing at these developments, and that's not what I'm hearing from the city agencies. It, 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 it sounds like, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that, but nobody's coming back. Nobody's coming back to see if these programs are actually working. I actually met with PAL for Wagner, for instance, and I said, well, are you supposed to be at PAL? That's what I'm reading is part of the MAP program. Well, we did one event last year. There's no reason why there shouldn't be programming happening at this development every single weekend. There should be something happening all of the time. Same thing happened with SYEP. We're supposed to be recruiting kids for SYEP. I walked the grounds for, uh, to recruit kids at those MAP sites this summer. And what the kids were saying was, we don't want to apply for SYEP. Well, why don't you, why, why don't you want to apply for SYEP? Because they're going to send us to work at NYCHA developments and we're going to get beat up. We don't want to work at NYCHA developments. So who's, who's talking to the young people to determine that, you know, what their issues are so that then they could make corrective action and then maybe better market this to, so that they, they understand that they're not being sent to necessarily to NYCHA development. They could work at my office, they could work wherever, but we're getting them involved in the programs that we're putting in there to supposedly reduce gun violence. So, you know, really, I'm just voicing, you know, my frustration because this comes on the heels of a seven-year-old getting shot yesterday, and this is, as you can see, based on, you know, all of the other incidents that I, I reported, it's been over two months of consecutive, somebody's getting shot, I'm tired of standing on the corners. I'm, st I'm tired of saying I'm sorry. I'm tired of giving false hope to my constituents. And so there has to be something done. We need to make sure that we're providing, actually providing programming at these developments. And I wanna know specifically in my developments what programs are in there, and I wanna know when they started, who's running them, how many times they're operating. If you're doing, if you're claiming that you're doing all of these ext extracurricular activities, which I am not seeing, then I want to know when they were done, how many people came and how, what was the outreach plan? Because I don't see any of this happening. And I also want to know what the heck is NYCHA doing? Because as far as I'm concerned, NYCHA's response to everything is call the police. Call the police. Call the police. The police department is not the private security system for the New York City Housing Authority. The, the New York City Housing Authority is a landlord and has the responsibility to ensure the public safety of each and every resident that lives at those developments. And that is not happening. That is not happening. And then we sit here and we cry because we're saying that the police is over policing and, 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 and locking up all our young people. Well, maybe if we were dealing with those families that need you know, a little bit of more supportive services, then maybe we wouldn't be here. So I want to know what exactly is NYCHA's plan other than calling the police to remediate some of the violence that I'm seeing in my district. Okay, okay. Good afternoon, Councilwoman. Um, thank you for um, reading the letter, the testimony, everything that you've presented to us. You are right. We have to do a better job of coordinating. There are a lot of resources in your district, and we are trying to do that. Someone mentioned earlier that we can't just be defensive, that we have to be offensive. And that's how we see the work of the stakeholders. The things that they choose may seem innocuous, um, gardens, activating green space, but really those things are offensive to Majority Leader Cumbo's point about creating an environment where crime cannot thrive. Things have to be um, beautified and maintained. We have to create these opportunities for people to come together in a positive way. And so we want to promote that through the stakeholder teams. From the programmatic perspective, definitely we, we hear you. Um, in the past, when MAP started, all of the uh, developments got the exact same programs. Um, in the last year and a half, we have tried to be better at iterating on it. We haven't left. We're still there, um, to your point about um, who comes back to see whether or not things work. We are in communication with folks to understand um, how they interact with the programs, which ones they feel are working, which ones they feel are not. And honestly, you know, um, we didn't get into this situation overnight. And institutional racism and inequity are deeply entrenched. And it is difficult for us to climb out of it. That is not an excuse, but I do want you to know that we are proactively working on it. We have had, um, when I started with MAP, we did not have a guaranteed SYEP for all of the young people at MAP sites. We do have that now. And in, you know, your district, we have progressively reached more young people um, every year. 
we know that there is mistrust between residents and government because of the things that have happened historically. And so the uptake of our programs, as with every program, um, sometimes is lacking. People don't always trust those opportunities because of the lack of opportunities that existed. And so we have a two-pronged thing that we have to do. We have to help people um, realize that the opportunities are real. Um, in, in doing that, we hope to get people to um, participate in them. But we also have a responsibility to listen when people say that those things don't work for their community and that they're not working. And that is part of the reason why we have these stakeholders to inform us on what their priorities are. Um, in terms of um, coordinating for the summer and the youth issues in East Harlem, um, I think that you were made aware, but I'm not quite sure, um, that there was a roundtable recently between the youth providers in your neighborhood, the engagement coordinator, SCAN, um, GOSO, a number of partners participated in that. We are hoping to have a proactive strategy for the summer. Um, I, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna stop you right there, I'm gonna tell you that I met with the same stakeholders and there is no plan. And I actually had to bring everyone in to sit down to find out what exactly are you doing with the public dollars that you're receiving? because we're not seeing that translate into the communities that we're providing services or supposed to be providing services for. And I wanted to see a map of what this summer was gonna look like. Because if we have all of these programs providing services at specific developments that are high volume you know, crime uh, areas, then there shouldn't be a moment in time when there's a lapse of service. And yet, it took that meeting to initiate a, a larger conversation, because I'll tell you that I'm not even privy to those conversations, because the elected officials are completely cut out of the equation when it comes to MAP and when it comes to anything else. And we're the only ones that know where the money's coming. We're the, only, we're the ones that are funding a lot of these programs, and yet nobody consults with us to find out what, you know, what we think is happening. Um, so, you know, listen, I'm gonna continue to have meetings and I'm gonna continue to dig and I'm gonna continue to push people to do what they're supposed to do because I, I was actually at, at Carver Houses a couple of weeks ago and this mother was like hysterical crying. Her son just got shot under the, under the, the CCTV cameras that we put in. He was shot and murdered there, 20 years old. Um, there's nothing that I'm gonna be able to do to bring her, her son back, but she was hysterical crying because she wanted the NYPD van that was removed from 104th Street between Park and Madison put back. Um, there needs to be more. I don't, I don't wanna hear about beautifying gardens. I don't see the correlation between fixing a garden and reducing gun violence. Yes, people should feel great about where they live. Yes, it's nice to walk into a beautiful environment, but that is not reducing gun violence. I'm sorry, it isn't. And if that is the focal point of MAP, then I will tell you that you need to scrap it and you need to start again. Okay, so I hear what you're saying, but I want to also reiterate that what the residents choose to focus on for their crime prevention through environmental design project is their decision. Self that is not true. Is That's also that. not true. That, that is, is true. not true. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna discuss it with you because I, I mean I could be here forever, but that is not true because the residents did not decide that they would focus primarily on the gardens as a way of reducing gun violence in their community. That's what they were told was the, what the program was about. When I ask anyone in my district, what is MAP, beautification projects at public housing? What the heck is the correlation between the beautification projects and the reduction in crime? There hasn't been any, MAP's been there for three years, enough time for you to be able to measure whether or not it was successful. I'm not gonna ask any more questions. I think I made my point. I will have a separate meeting uh, in the next, in the coming weeks with NYPD and with NYCHA because I want to know what the plan is for my district come for this summer because my residents cannot continue to live terrorized in their own communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms., uh, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Next we'll hear from Councilman Berg, Joe Nye. Thank you, Chairs. Um, it's very difficult to follow my colleagues and their passion and their commitment. But I do have some basic questions. I would imagine when it comes to safety and security, it's our priority. We want to make sure that everyone feels safe in their home and in their community. There's a preactive approach to that, to prevent crimes from happening, which include deterrents such as cameras law enforcement, verticals, presence, patrols. And then there's a reactive approach, 
And the reactive approach would be, if there's an incident, a crime, what are we going to do to prevent that similar crime from reoccurring? All right, this is, I imagine we're all on the same page on this one. Two years, and um, where's that gentleman that was talking about the security? Uh, if you can grab a seat, because some of these questions are going to be directed towards you. Two years and two murders later, we're still bidding on camera and security installations. That inherently is the problem. And the frustrations that you've heard echoed from so many of my colleagues, the limited funding that we do have available, we put into projects to fill a void, to address an issue that's not being addressed, to only find out that it's going to be years before you guys get out of your own way to spend the money that was allocated to you. And I'm gonna use your own numbers, and I just wanna make sure that I understood this. When you do security evaluations, you have a team of 12, you do 40 per quarter, correct? 40 buildings per quarter. Developments. 40 developments, developments per quarter. Per quarter. So we have 325 developments. Using that math, you're looking at roughly two years for all of our developments to be surveyed. Correct. I don't see that actually being done by a group of 12 and to have a thorough evaluation where you can go through 40 compliments. Well, I'm going to break it down because now I'm really intrigued. So that's 40 complexes. We got 2,418 buildings. Is that correct, Chair? 2,400 buildings. 2,400 buildings. Divide that by 40. Right? Yes. You'd, actually, it's got to be 160. You're doing 15 buildings a day. Yes, we are. That's we're, we're averaging at least two to three developments every week. And a development can go as far as one building to as much as maybe 35 buildings. It all depends on the, com uh, on the size of the campus. That's seven days a week using the number 15. Not necessarily. Okay, well, maybe five actually, days a week. Maybe I should clarify. You can, you can, you can tell me and the um, chairs that 15 buildings, that's more than one building per person on making their assessments, can be done in a day adequately. Walking Absolutely. that building and determine all those needs and seeing, evaluating the corners that the current systems are not. Um, capturing, that's impossible. I come from this business. I come out of real estate. Some of these complexes are 20 stories high. For you to walk the staircase can take a half a day. Let alone evaluate every need of that building. I'm going to get back to that. What is the cost of, I think this was already asked, but no one had an answer for a CCTV system per building? Would it have to be broken down per camera, I would imagine? Yes. What is that cost, roughly? Don't have the numbers at this point in time. We can get Will you back please to get that to me? Absolutely. I want to go back to the doors and the evaluations and that whole protocol about every day that we're evaluating and making a walkthrough to see what doors are closed and operating properly and then what we do from there. But my bigger question is, doors don't break daily and there's vandalism involved. And the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. What are we doing to prevent those doors from being vandalized so there is some security in these buildings? 
Are we putting cameras there to actually catch the culprits in the act? And then once we catch the culprits, what are we actually doing? And what if they're repeat offenders? What are we doing? And this may be a little counter to what some of my colleagues feel about arrests and trespassing. Can't have it both ways, right? Correct. That we're going to have to arrest somebody to prevent the crime from continuing. There's got to be some law enforcement. And I asked a bunch of questions, but I'm going to go back to yesterday's meeting with the Pelham Parkway Tenants Association, newly formed, NYCHA property, what was once the iconic NYCHA facility for the state has deteriorated to a condition that's deplorable. And two of the conditions, chairs, that they brought up were, Mark, I can't get the assistance that I need. I have a group of 20 or more young and adults that are smoking marijuana that don't get out of your way to go up the stairs and our seniors are threatened, the tenants are threatened, and there is nothing that we can do. We're not going to give them tickets, we're not going to arrest them, where we, every time there is a vertical that's done, they run to another building. What are we going to do? The second issue they brought up is the trespassers. And most of these complexes have first floor windows, we have peeping toms. What are we going to do if we're not going to ticket them, arrest them, give the patrols or the manpower that's needed? What are we, and these are not residents. I want to reiterate this. Trespassers don't belong there. They're not visiting, they're not guests. Barbecuing all night long peeping into people's apartments, using the grounds and the buildings as their urinals, and smoking marijuana, that is a quality of life issue for the residents that live there that don't care to have that aroma work their way into their apartments, nor do they want to expose their children to that type of behavior. What are you guys going to do? I want to be a partner, and I want to be that bully pulpit for you. If you can't say it, I'll say it for you. What do you need? Thank you for your question. Just to respond to some of the comments that you made, yes, there is uh, a lot that needs to be done. And as I mentioned before, I spoke about the Housing Authority, and I'm going, not going to, you know, kind of go over that in depth. However, you know, I spoke about us checking the doors daily. Yes, the doors are vandalized. Yes, we do have issues at time with keeping the doors locked. However, we continue to emphasize to the staff that it is still our responsibility that if those doors break daily, it is our responsibility to ensure that they are repaired. I agree. Okay. So now so I agree with you. We're going to repair them every day and that's not the case, but we're right. saying they're going to be repaired daily. We know that's not the case. Right. And we're going to improve that. We're going to try to make that better where on a 24-hour emergency basis, we're going to have repair crews out there. Well, because months go by without these doors being repaired. And that means months go by where you're getting, you're allegedly there's a report that's generated from the super to the maintenance supervisor to the manager to somebody and it's just okay. a vicious wheel. And so in response to some of your other concerns, when we talk about you know, acts of vandalism and crime at the development. Yes, at some of our developments, we do have CCTV cameras, and yes, we do have staff that are responsible for reviewing the cameras. What we can also, at, at times, again, you know, when our staff review the cameras, sometimes they may not be able to identify the individuals who are in the footage. However, property management are able to reach out to some of our, I would say, resident leaders, if they would like to, off record. And at times, you know, if we can identify if people live in the complex or if individuals notify us individually, then property management can take the proper follow-up action by calling in a resident. In addition, when individuals are arrested for major crimes, right, it is our responsibility 
to ensure that we follow up and call in those families and where necessary, call those families in for termination of tenancy. I also have, you know, I don't have to read it off, but I do have data. How many, I'm sorry, how many doors were broken last year? You gave us a number. Sure. I, I remember 2,582 were still not addressed. Okay. What I provided you with, I mentioned that for the past 12 months, from June 2018, from May of 2019, there was a total of work orders created of 62,625 work orders. For? The entire year. When I talk about doors, I'm talking about our interior doors, our stair hall doors, our front entrance doors, our rear exit doors. Okay. Of the 62,000 doors. Of the 62,225 work orders that were created for repairs, it may have been repairs, it may have been broken glass, it may have been a variety of missing doorknob. What was that number? 62,625, number of work orders created. We closed a total of 60,437 work orders. Stay with me on that one. Yes. Of the 62,000 doors. That work orders that, work created, orders. yes, work orders created throughout all of our developments throughout the city. About doors? This is doors, yes. Okay. How many vandals have been arrested? How many actions have you brought against families to evict? Because according to what you said, one of the options that you have is you'll bring in tenant leaders to figure out who's doing the damage. Then if you determine that it's a, a resident, you'll actually let me Issue clarify. A letter? Yeah. Yes, I would like to clarify. It's not always resident leaders. Let me just clarify. I want to mention that if they would like to, they're able to view the footage or their board members with the personnel, NYCHA, in order to try to identify these families. At many times, again, if we can identify the individual who, again, is causing the vandalism, we will follow up. At this time, I cannot identify out of the number of work orders that I have here how many s residents have been called in for the vandalism. Many times the doors at times are vandalized, sometimes during the evening, during the day when no one is around. And it's very difficult to identify individuals if we don't have the footage. Good. However, so my point, we said we can be proactive to prevent a crime from happening, or we can be reactive that once a crime occurs that we take measures to prevent it from reoccurring. So if you don't have cameras that could actually capture the vandalism that's being done, whether it be resident or a non-resident. I'm sorry. Again, may, there are times where, where again, if they see individuals on the footage, they may not be able to identify the individual perhaps as being a resident. So that has been reported over the years as well. So it can be, and, and I do know that there have been incidences throughout the agency over the years where individuals have been identified for a variety of things, vandalism to the cameras, vandalism to the doors. So there have been, there have been cases where individuals have been identified and property management staff has taken the appropriate action to call in that family and send that family down for termination of tenancy. In many instances, again, it depends on the type of crime. Mm -hmm. Of course, that family may not, their tenancy may not be terminated, but again, depending on the type of crime, it's a possibility that that individual may be permanently excluded from the household. Now, if you would like us to perhaps go further into our policy, I can have Daniel Kiss, who is here with us representing our law department, who is um, the chief of our tenant administration and hearing division. He's here and he can come up and also give testimony. That would be great, but I wanna get back to why it took two years for you to still bid on cameras after two murders and we still don't have, and that'll probably mean another year or so after the bid is done that the cameras go in. So in essence, you're looking at perhaps four years for CCTV cameras to be installed in a complex of over 200 units, is that what, of senior housing, is that what I remember? Or was that four, 400 units, double murder. Can you elaborate on this so we have a better understanding? I mean, it only took one day to survey the building, right? 
at this point in time, the, the uh, pricing that we got for both developments, for both buildings, because Woodson is, does, is comprised of two buildings side by side. Mm -hmm. We have a total of $680,000 to make this thing happen. Yeah, what was that dollar now? Uh, $680,000. To make what happens? To basically put in the cameras and the uh, layered access. Great. So work, th work, work this out for us. In one day, you surveyed that building. What happened the following day? Well, the first day, we went and we surveyed both buildings. Mm -hmm. After that, we, we engaged with capital projects and got a pricing for all the equipment that would be available, well, in other words, to be utilized at that location. How long did that take? Excuse me? How long did that take? Probably a, a few days. Very good. So now we're up to four days. Then what happens? At this point in time, the process goes over to capital projects at this point in time. Who can After tell me what happens at capital now? Steve Lovesey. Chairs, thank you for the consideration, but I think we're going to shed some light on something here. Okay. Um, to clarify, this is obviously an example, but um, if there is funding associated to that project, then that project would go into design, obviously procurement, and then construction. So walk me through this. Four days after that gentleman's team went out, made the evaluation, suggested the equipment that was needed, it was sent to your department, capital. Where are we and what time frame did you need now? The money was allocated, 680000 It's two years later. I need you to help me fill out the gap. Okay. Um, I've been told that there's no funding allocated for that development, but we, would sit, we can definitely sit down with you outside of this hearing, go through that particular project, and, and work out a timeline. If you would like me to go through a, a scenario of a project that's funded, we can, I can go through that with you. Chairs, I apologize. I thought we were going to set some light here on an issue, and apparently we're not, because apparently we just got stonewalled again. I just heard there was money of allocated, 680000 and within a minute, there was no money allocated. So I doubt we're going to get to the bottom of this well, I, without but your help. Just a quick follow-up on that. Is there a separate um, um, like line or budget for cameras at all? I know that, you know, we already know that there's a budget in place for um, boilers and elevators and, and lead remediation and everything else. Is there at all a focus, a plan, a strategy right now for cameras outside of the council or the state legislators? allocating that money? Um, Chairman, I will get to your question very immediately. I just want to, council member, to explain. The estimate that you were given, that number that you were given, you were asking how much a camera system would be for two buildings. That was just an estimate. We're under, I, we would have to double check the FMS system, but it is our understanding that there is no allocated funds for this project. We can talk offline, but at this point in time, there's no allocated. Then I'm going to refer to the to question the chair just asked. Yep. Is there a pot of money that's set aside specifically for security and cameras? I believe that was the question, chair. And I will, so we come to you and in a capital hearing to explain the budget, the dollar amount, and mm -hmm. our needs according to the physical needs assessment and where we allocate those funds. The majority of the funds for the, for the capital program are going to go to the roofs, the bricks, 
the heating plants, the gas risers, those items that are associated to um, the residential buildings, there is some funds that go to the entrances, but the majority of the funds, there's a small grant that comes in from federal, um, the majority of the funds associated to CCTV, layered access, and cameras comes from discretionary funds from the council members, uh, the state DASNY portfolio that was. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, because you know we've been here a while now. When I asked my question just now, I specifically said, I understand that there's funding for boilers and elevators and everything else I just listed. And then I said, can you explain to me the planning or funding outside of the funding from the council and the state legislators? I specifically said that. And so your response just now was kind of regurgitated, like spitting back to me, like you're answering a question based on using the same language in the question. So, I'm at, so, I, so we've covered all that. So I'm asking what is NYCHA's plan outside of the funding that you get from the city council and the state assembly? And to be specific, can you speak to the $680,000 that's needed for Woodson? Because you said during this testimony that, they, that clearly you have identified a, a, an urgent need in Woodson. So if you've identified an urgent need for cameras, can you explain to me, like, what are you doing about that? So I'm going to answer your first question. Our city funding is allocated specifically for items. Those are capital items. So if it is an allocation for roofs, we use that for roofs. If it's an allocation for brickwork, we use that for masonry. Um, federal dollars are focused on um, those items that the city can't afford, things like steam pipe systems. So in terms of the overall portfolio, no, very little federal dollars, and we can get you the exact number, it's a small grant, go to CCTV and layered access. It is only the funds that are allocated from the city for CCTV and layered access that go to CCTV and layered access. So unless we pay for cameras in our budget, then there will be no cameras at all installed in NYCHA developments. Out of the capital funds. Out of any funds. I can speak for capital. Our capital funds go to heating plants, brick roofs. And so, so it is your testimony today that unless the city council or state representatives pay for cameras in the developments, there will be no installation of cameras in the developments. My testimony is that city funds are allocated and I can only use those funds for what it is allocated for. So if it is allocated for roofs, I can only use those funds for roofs. Would you like to answer that question? I would just like to respond. So how much has NYCH invested in cameras in LAC? I will respond to that. Since 2014, 192,262,000 uh, 192 million has been invested in cameras and LAC. Most so what of this does that funding, mean? So that's, that's funding this, not, yes, that, most, that did not come from right. city council? Most of this funding comes from the city council. Okay. We appreciate this partnership that keeps, keeps the residents safe. NYCHA has invested 156, 306, 196, and DSNY managed 35, uh, 956, 866 million. So I'm a yes or no? Yes. If yes. city council did not, if not one of my colleagues allocated funding for new cameras, would NYCHA be able to install new cameras in a development? And let's speak directly to Woodson Houses. $680,000 is needed 
to install cameras in Woodson houses? And does that include the, the, the sock? Does that include the brain? Yeah. That so that's 500,000 that for the brain. And if it's 680, that means 180,000 for the cameras in the two buildings. Chair, can I please, uh, I would just like to, because I don't think you've asked for this information before, but I do have it. You wanted to know the cost of the installation in the sock. I do have that here. So I would like to provide that to you, if that's fine. I know you had asked what earlier in the testimony. Oh, I thought somebody answered that. Okay. Okay. So just to let you know, this is an example for a development with two buildings, two entrances, and two elevators. The cost estimate would be approximately $680,000. Like Woodson? The sock is one per development would be 160,000. Low voltage center, which would be one per building, would be $15,000. The fiber per building would be 15,000. So you told that up? Yes, the outside cameras uh, would be eight per building, which is 52. The inside cameras, four per building, would be 26,000. And lobby cameras, two per entrance, would be $13,000 for a total of $680,000 for two buildings. Okay, so that's back at Woodson. So Woodson's two buildings, right? So that's where you get the number, the, the 680, right? So the question is still, there's an urgent need for cameras at Woodson. How are you going to get the funding to install the cameras at Woodson? The bulk of the funding, and I think this goes back to reiterating that same answer, the bulk of the funding comes from the city council and those discretionary funds for CCTV cameras. Is it difficult to just answer a question directly? We, we don't put these. No, seriously, is it difficult? We don't put these. No, the, you're asking me the question about where we're getting the funds to do this work. And you know our physical needs assessment. You know our budget. But I problem, also know when you need to prioritize we, something, we prioritize. you prioritize it and you get it done when you want to get it done. So my question is, you had an 84-year-old that was killed in a building two years ago, then you had another 83-year-old woman killed in the same exact building, and there's been a need for cameras, and the community has been asking for cameras for quite some time now, and these two buildings are located directly across the street from a map site. Van Dyke Houses, where the mayor and the commissioner himself sat and did a COPSTAT meeting on February 5th. And then that same week, Commissioner O'Neill came back and met with the community about the needs in the community and the crime. And then turned around and walked down the block with Sade Better and Wild from Eyewitness News and talked about the increase in crime in that neighborhood. And so you already, so yeah, I know the issues that you have. But you also know what you've been dealing with. And you also know your budgets and what you prioritize based on the funding that you get in. So is this a priority? And if it is, why are you depending or stressing that we need to pay for it when you have the funding to be able to pay for it by maneuvering some other deals that you have going on? So the question is, how are you going to make that happen? I can't speak for that. Council member, we will, we will get back to you with a response. That, My bad, I, you were talking. No, no, thank you, Chairs. I'm ready to wrap up because I loved it. You were, I asked for your assistant. I couldn't get the, um, the answers that I was looking for, but I think we're on to something, and I think we're going to continue. I do want to go back to the questions about what am I going to do with Pelham Parkway housing. Yesterday's meeting with the new association brought to my attention the group of young men and adults numbering up to 20 that are smoking marijuana, taking up staircases, preventing residents from being able to use the staircase. Is that one of our as well as the trespassing that's done on the grounds with all night long barbecuing and music playing that is going to impact us the whole summer with the peeping toms that are going up to the windows of the first floor apartments. Uh, I'll look into it and I'll address the, uh, the issues that you, you bring forth. You know. That's what I told them yesterday, that I'm gonna have to look into it, I'm gonna have to figure this out with the local precinct and um, 
Pardon, yeah. I, I mean, council member, we'll connect with you. I mean, you brought this to our attention. I will address it. Uh, we'll talk to you offline and get specifics about where exactly these complaints are, specifically in the, in the in the process. And whoever's, whether it's the precinct or or, or housing, will address the conditions. I mean, what you're describing are crimes. I mean, there, there's no two ways about it, right? People can't trespass. That's against the law. Uh, smoking marijuana in public is against the law. Uh, we try our best to to alleviate some of the lower level crimes through non-enforcement solutions. But at the end of the day, and you crystallize the point, uh, sometimes enforcement's necessary. And we have those options on the books still. Uh, and if we can't resolve it, if we can't address the concerns of the of the residents that you're highlighting to us through non-enforcement means, then we're gonna address it through enforcement means. But the end result is, is that the people that are coming to you, the residents that are coming to you, uh, that can't live their lives, that their quality of life is being negatively impacted, that can't stand. That's not, a, that, that's not an appropriate end result here. So whichever way we're gonna address it, whether it be enforcement or non-enforcement, we are gonna address it. And excuse me, I would like also like to mention that the Housing Authority would also join you uh, with the councilman in, in that meeting as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, so much. I'm just going to wrap up with a few questions. Um, so just getting back to NYCHA for a second. Um, so you spoke of vandalism, I think, uh, believe of the doors. Um, in a situation like that, would you then contact, would your property manager then contact the NYPD to alert them um, that there's doors open or how would, or we would just leave it until that door um, was serviced? Well, basically what they do is that they're required to contact uh, the PD and also our Office of Safety and Security just to let them know so they can make that a post condition that, that, that that door is not locking and that it is open. Okay, and how do we know? And just, and I'm not trying to be funny. No, here, that's fine. But I just think checks and balances is, is important. Um, and just going back to the assessment, so they would they would then contact PD. How do you know that they're doing that? Okay, so the managers they can they will normally call PD and they will speak with them and let them know. Who would they speak with in PD? Um, I would say an officer. I would have to find out who they speak okay. to, but when you speak with the managers, they would let you know. And I just also wanted to mention that our managers and superintendents have a very good rapport with the NCOs as well. So if they're having issues at the location, they do speak with them and they do inform them where they're having their but, issues. But that question goes back once again, the, the million dollar question, how do you know that that's actually happening? Well, because there's a lot of discretion right. given to the managers, and I expect managers right. to be treated with respect and dignity okay. because they are managers. Right. But just as in my office I have managers, there are checks and balances. So I still want to get reports from my managers. So would, who in NYCHA would then receive a transcript of, you know, what's happening? So just to let you know, we do have visibility into what is going on at the development based on the number of work orders in the system and what they call their service level agreements, right? So realistically, I mean, I have, like I mentioned, approximately 70 properties. I cannot get an update every single day from a property. So the visibility is there with reports that we're able to go into the system and review. As mentioned before, the structure in the boroughs is that the managers and superintendents report into a regional asset manager who oversee approximately five to seven properties. It is their responsibility to touch bases with the managers, to review our online reports, to review our work orders, again, to see what the productivity is, and also to do spot checks. Our regional asset managers are also required, as I mentioned previously, to check specific items at a development. And again, they're responsible for checking to ensure that each of their developments are performing the daily checklist and also putting in work orders. Right, and does the, these reports ever reach the chairperson's desk? Uh, I have the reports. So the reports that, again, 
the our assessments report. and everything reach just so very when we talk question. about the assessments again I mm. will have to mm -hmm. speak with the Office of Safety and Security regarding the reports that are going out to property management when we talk about the oversight of the doors and the daily maintenance of the doors and the property mm -hmm. the lights that is the responsibility of property management got that but does do these reports ever reach the chairperson's desk the reports, okay, so I can say again, the chair. Yes and no question. Well, I, well, when I talk, when you talk and about. And if you're unaware, if it's not well, happening, that's okay. But I just want to know, okay. do these reports reach the chairperson? So or? again, I can't say if they reach the chairperson. Okay. However, I can okay. say that we all, all of the housing authority employees, we do have access. Those who are working in the offices, we do have access to reports. And I'm pretty sure that individuals in the chair office they provide, you know, information regarding okay. reports and statistics as well. Okay. All righty. Um, just uh, last few questions, too. I know Oleg is used to me saying this. Um, PSAs, um, can you just speak to um, how much personnel is assigned in each, to each PSA? And then just speak to any, are there any additional needs um, that PSAs need uh, across the city? And then for communities that don't have PSAs, uh, Chief Secreto, would you still oversee those developments or you just specifically oversee the um, PSAs? Uh, so I guess you're alluding to like out in Far Rockaway, Rockaway, Staten Island. Yeah, those are overseen by the patrol uh, borough. So uh, Queens South and Staten Island cover. And, but cover. you're in charge of housing technically, right? Yes. For NYCHA. Yes. Um, is there any reason that you wouldn't oversee those developments? I think. Or is that a commissioner call? I think logistically, because they were so far away that they were, uh, you know, handed off to patrol. So, you know, for response uh, purposes or whatever, I think it would be a long uh, trek from PSA 9 to get out to the Rockaways and for PSA 1 to get out to uh, Staten Island. Do you think that you should have jurisdiction over, since you're this, your commissioner, I mean, the, the chief of housing, do you think <laughs> that it would be wiser to just have all of the developments under your jurisdiction to a greater degree? Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, Council. Oh, leg. This sounds like a commissioner question. But sure. I think uh, I think you're you're answering your own question. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, I think the important piece to point out is if you take a look at the Rockaways and what we did, um, you know, going into this hearing is took a look at compared today's numbers versus 1995. Mm -hmm. Sign mm -hmm. The significance of 95 mm -hmm. was when housing police were actually dedicated, for example, to the Rockaways. Crime is down 74% yep. versus versus that time. So, and the other thing to point but out- the, and and I, I Not think, to cut you off, but yeah. let me tell you why. It's because it's the culmination of cure violence, the, the crisis management system, yep. jobs, <laughs> um, real community engagement, community centers that are actually starting to function, they weren't really functioning. So it's a real culmination of things that have really driven the crime down out there. We still have ways to yep. go, um, but obviously that's not happening across the entire city. So um, I mean, on, on your but, point, I, I right. think I agree with you. And mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that is neighborhood policing, right? Mm -hmm. Not to solve every issue, mm -hmm. every condition mm -hmm. through greater enforcement and more troops on the ground is to think out of the box mm -hmm. and, and come up with other solutions. I mean, the important, one important point I want to highlight is uh, even though housing the, for example, the Rockaways, we'll use the Rockaways because that's your district, but uh, the Rockaways, even though they don't fall under Housing Bureau, the precincts that cover actually have a dedicated uh, contingent of officers that are specifically mm -hmm. tasked with uh, yeah. patrolling housing in your district. Um, the other piece to highlight is, and you, you mentioned some of the non-enforcement programs, and the chief can certainly go into um, some of the things we're doing that are out of the box, not necessarily enforcement based, um, to address crime. And I think you highlighted some really good points. We also have points, for example, a basketball league that we created mm -hmm. that has a classroom component, and the chief will go into that. A virtual reality program mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we do, uh, JRIP that we do. Um, and the football other, league is starting. Right. And then we mm -hmm. have additional programs that we partner with NYCHA and we partner with other sister agencies. To, to 
to address other concerns and, and to, to address issues not necessarily through enforcement. And I, I think, I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's working because we're actually seeing, at least in the last five years, arrests are down by 140,000 arrests in a year. Uh, summonses are down by close to 80 percent. Street stops are down from a height of close to 700,000 in, in 2011, I think, to under 11,000 last year. The jail population is below 10,000, right? So we're actually, and crime is at record lows year over year. So we're able to address crime through neighborhood policing, through these new strategies, without necessarily defaulting to enforcement, and we're actually seeing positive results. Great, got that. But I'm just, I'm trying to understand why Chief Secreto would not have all of public housing in his portfolio if he's the chief of housing. Well, I, and why I think would the... Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, like anything else, like all deployments, anytime we redraw sectors, anytime we add a precinct, for example, the 116 or the 121 in Staten Island, Lines are with uh, lines are redrawn. Um, we do these evaluations based on what we're seeing on the ground. The department always does these evaluations, and decisions were made, just logis logistic-based decisions, not to shortchange any particular uh, development anywhere in the city, but to better address and more f uh, give a much more rapid response to the needs of those particular. Got it. Developments. Got it. Got it. But you know, whenever, and at least the. The, the press conferences I've been to, whenever there's an issue about public housing, the person who's on the hot seat is him. And he has to respond whether it's um, PSAs or not. So I'm just, let's have further conversations on this, sure. because I think there should just be <laughs> one central place that we look to when it comes to housing, and it seems to be all over the place right now. Um, last uh, other questions um, for Mock J. Um, uh, is there a plan to expand crisis management system? Appreciate the work MAP does, but we know crisis management has certainly worked. Is there anything in the works on that? And then I guess the, the question, and, and I do want to be sensitive to NYCHA to a great degree on the cameras because they have so many other structural needs and it would be irresponsible for me to sit here and say that I shouldn't chip in. I don't mind chipping and I think I probably funded every development out in the Rockaways <laughs> um, for, for CCTVs. But what, what other investments or structural things should we be looking at um, that you think could make the world much easier for all of, all of you and for NYCHA residents? So if we had to think outside the box and give one or two things, what are some investments that you think um, could work? And once again, um, I applaud the NYPD because I know my colleagues may differ. We don't need more enforcement that has not shown that it's worked <laughs> in the past. Um, so I think the direction that you're moving is moving in is the correct um, uh, correct direction. Um, but what are some other things that we can be doing um, collectively to make the world better when it comes to community investments? Let's start with Mach J. Thank you for that question. So uh, to your first question, I, I could not begin to speak for the crisis management system. I only speak for MAP. But in terms of what is working, we are in the middle of an evaluation with promising results about the impact Who's doing the evaluation? John J. is doing the okay. evaluation. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm happy to mm -hmm. share the preliminary results with you. Um, Any plans to expand MAP outside of these 16 developments? Uh, outside of the 15 map developments, 15, we are we are still building the car and driving it. So we're okay. trying to perfect the neighborhood stat model. Okay. There are various parts of the initiative that we know uh, residents find effective that have benefited other developments. So there's the 44 developments have received permanent lighting upgrades or allocations for them. Some of those have been com completed, including uh, a pilot at Whitman and Jefferson and three uh, developments so far, I believe, with uh, about 40 more or so to come. Um, what we've seen with SYEP and what has worked for the guaranteed slots that MAP residents have this year, um, NYCHA has their own special um, allocation the same way that MAP does outside of MAP developments for a few of their developments as well. And then um, there's also the extended hours, the late night hours in the summer and weekends for community centers. 
all the community centers have that, not just map development. Um, and let me just go back to, to that again. I mean, why do we have to wait for developments to be crime ridden before we expand map? All developments should have maps. So I think we should go with that as our mindset. We don't have to wait for the building to start burning down <laughs> before we respond. So I think that should be something that you, you look at citywide, whether we have the money or not, just planning with yeah. that in mind. We should yeah, not I mean, wait till developments reach the peak of crime to then want to respond. We're like definitely we should, not um, doing yeah. that. As you yeah. heard, the gentleman from Seth Lowe that was here earlier spoke very positively about what MAP is doing for his neighborhood. He doesn't live in a MAP development. So the resources and the events and the programming and all these opportunities for community and cohesion extend to the residents who And do you think $50,000 is enough? So I want to clarify, MAP has invested over $100 million in programming alone to date. Um, 100 million. And uh, more than $400 million total. The $50,000 is just um, for the resident teams to allocate for themselves. I don't know any other initiative that gives residents that, that money to allocate for themselves for public safety matters. I'm not by any means saying that that's enough. It's more like seed money for them mm -hmm. to realize the first step in their vision. And in some areas, they're working with their council person to engage on how their priorities. And can we get a breakdown on how that 400 million was spent? Sure. Um, so that's a request that we have. Um, I think I think that is that is my. And, and if there are there any other investments that you believe we should be doing um, that would make life easier for Nitro residents? Uh, Councilman, if I uh, we have a we have a successful program out in East New York and Brownsville at United Cornerstone Basketball League. Mm -hmm. And this is about, I think this is our fifth season, going to kick off in July. And it's a cops and kids basketball league, but, and there's nothing necessarily new about that. Mm -hmm. But what makes this program so unique is that the kids have to participate in a classroom component. Uh, and, and in this classroom component, there's, um, there's job, uh, job opportunities, there's resume building, there's uh, life skills, there's GED uh, prep, college prep, um, there's guest speakers, some athletes come. I know John Wallace, a former Nick and uh, alum of Syracuse, he came the first year and uh, they have stakeholders that invest in this program and it's been, it's been very successful. We, uh, some anecdotal stories, one kid wanted out of a gang and uh, through this program he was able to get out of the gang. Uh, another one, who was going to join a gang as his, uh, because of his involvement with this basketball league, he decided against joining the gang, which his family members were, and he went in another direction. Uh, we were also able to, uh, the, the first year, the, the um, MVP of the league, a uh, very good basketball player, he divulged that he was homeless, that, that him and his family were homeless, and we were able to help him along with uh, the stakeholders to get uh, his family an apartment, get a voucher for an apartment. So this league has been highly successful. Um, what I haven't been able to do is expand it to the other PSAs uh, you know, throughout the city. It, it would be a home run if we could. What we have been able to expand on is now the second component. It's called options, where they have virtual reality scenarios. I think the uh, police commissioner talked about it back in January at his uh, state of the NYPD. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually borrowed that, I won't say stole, they actually borrowed that starting PSA 2 and now uh, looking to expand it citywide, and they have. But uh, what it does is, since a lot of these young people are into uh, computer and video games and what have you, and it's kind of uh, modeled after our FAT system firearm simulator uh, that the police department has, the kids get, uh, they get a headset and they're, um, they're faced with different scenarios. Uh, maybe a gang initiation, maybe getting high, maybe holding a gun, a female holding a gun, a purse for somebody, different scenarios that these kids help design and uh, curriculum that DOE uh, drew up. So if we could expand on those programs, um, would be a home run. NYCHA. You said, where do you start? <laughs> no. Thank you for your question. I'm not going to ask for more cameras because I know that that has been asked before. But what I would like to do, I've been in the Housing Authority for many, many years. And um, we've held meetings, you know, within developments or within communities where we've had high crimes or quality of life issues. 
So in addressing some of the issues collectively between NYPD, collaboration between MOCJ, PD, and also some of the council members, you know, if you have like problematic developments, perhaps let's go to that development and let's talk about what some of the various issues are. Let's talk about housing's rules and regulations and breach of rules and regulations and, you know, some of the issues that we're encountering to educate the residents collectively on how we can work together on improving condi conditions within, you know, within our communities. Talk about the issues about again, the doors, and being proactive instead of reactive. Again, you know, unfortunately, there are instances that occur that we can't control, but however, in moving forward proactively, perhaps we can look different, look, you know, to do things a little differently with responding beforehand collectively and going out to these de developments and just having meetings with the residents to educate them in areas of safety and security, housing rules and regulations, and you know perhaps there are other resources that we can also talk about at those meetings to help those within the community. Thank you. Turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. Um, one program that um, I didn't hear mentioned was the juvenile robbery intervention program, the JRIP program, and I mention that because I worked very closely and intimately with Chief Jaffe when she um, was working in Brownsville in East New York, coming out of PSA 2, out of the trail in the back, and I know the sister, um, Ms. Bennett, was talking about the robberies in her development and how you see that things changed because this young person is now incarcerated. But the juvenile robbery intervention program was to address that so the young folks did not have to go to jail. Um, it was an intervention program. And so, um, if you can, would you be able to explain to us what's happening with JRIP? Because I did speak to some of the officers a couple of weeks ago, and you know they're still around, but there's no um, increased resources um, placed into the program. So, can you talk about that? Yes. I, I, I just wanted to add something. I know uh, Councilman Richards uh, left, but with that United Cornerstone Basketball League, it started out the first season one development against another, Tilden against Van Dyke, Setlow, and then they in the, in the subsequent seasons they've decided to kind of integrate the development. So some kids from Tilden will play with some kids from Van Dyke, and, and that's big because they can't go, you know, you know out there, you can't, if you live in Tilden, uh, you can't go to Van Dyke and vice versa. So them playing on the same team was big. And uh, so, uh, and we're looking to, to expand on that as well. As far as uh, JRIP, it's still, still going well, uh, it's in, um, the seven, PSA 2 and the 7-3, PSA 5 and East Harlem 2-3, and uh, now in the 114 PSA 9. Uh, 1,000, 1,100 kids have gone through this uh, system, and uh, right now, I think the number's more like, um, the 63, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not gonna do the math here, it's 63 kids in PSA 2, 56 in PSA 5, and 89 in PSA 9. Uh, one of the things that we have done, and maybe we have to change the, uh, the name from uh, a robbery because we're seeing that these young kids, 14, 15, 16, are also involved in shootings now. So we don't want to just limit their, their uh, involvement to robberies. We're now including, especially up in East Harlem, Harlem as uh, uh, Councilwoman Ayala talked about, Wagner, Jefferson, a lot of these kids are 14 and 15 years old. So we've included them in the program. And, and what we do is we go and visit them at home, talk to the parents, uh, check their attendance at school, make sure they're going to school. And, uh, you know, some, some uh, as we were uh, getting uh, prepared yesterday, I got a text from, from the lieutenant from PSA 9 telling me that they just attended the uh, graduation. One of the kids graduated from a culinary school. And uh, uh, another kid graduated from um, Seton Hall. So there's like some success stories coming out of there. The stats are, you know, the stats, the, the robberies have come down, but more importantly, the kids are, are put on a, on a good path. Thank you. Um, we have, I remember one young man from the program um, was, he had a lot going on, but um, two years ago, he was the hired contracted photographer for the state assembly when they had their caucus. 
and that was a young man who was part of the program, worked the program, and his family was involved because one thing with Jay Rip is not just the young um, person, it's the wraparound services for the entire family. And so I would like when we're talking about MAP and the different programs and resources for, for, you know, for people to actually know about all the other programs that you have so that everyone can work together because when the sister talked about the robberies and her development at Polo Ground, I immediately thought about Jay Rip. And, in, it, and it could be some lessons learned there. So a lot of times we spin our wheels when there are programs and resources that are doing amazing jobs and they can be scaled up or incorporated into the program, but we're not doing that. We're all at the table thinking about the next great thing. And sometimes you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I, I just got a note from, uh, from Mark J that we have expanded the basketball program and, and, and she's 100% right. And they just had a tournament at, um, on 145th and uh, and the west side there, the, uh, the the park there, and we had teams from uh, the Bronx, uh, Harlem. There was one from uh, Newburgh, uh, upstate, and from uh, Suffolk County that they came and participated in it. And that's in addition to the map uh, tournaments that we have. Okay. Thank you. So we're just. Um, I only have three questions left and it's just more about clarity and it's just to breeze through quickly. Um, just how many developments um, do not have cameras right now and how many residents does that um, reflect? So that's just, so we just need to know the number of developments that do not have cameras. Um, and the difference in crime between those that do have cameras and the ones that don't. So if you can give us a, a comparison of the crime statistics between developments that have cameras and those developments that do not. And um, how many unlocked doors are there currently? And because you mentioned 2,580, and so I just wanted to know, is that the current number of doors that are unlocked? And if there is a timeline or a time frame? Yes, the information that I have here for the past 12 Oh, thank you for your question. I apologize. Uh, the, the information that I have here that I reported is from June 2018 through May of 2019. So we will have to give you current information. Okay. Okay. So we just need to know the current number of doors um, that are unlocked. And I did send over some pictures to you. Yes. And that's a picture. The, the first picture is of a door and the, the front door. And that is the senior development. That is Franklin Avenue. And you can clearly see where the door itself is taped up. And the other um, picture is of the staircase with feces, and the other is um, a homeless person's belongings um, under the scaffold, and the other is a man who assaulted one of your employees, a NYCHA worker. Mm -hmm. So those are the pictures that you have before you, and so um, after we can Sure. We can discuss it for follow-up. Sure. Um, and also, can you, the controller's report. In the controller's report yeah. from 2018, 299 developments were visited and 65%, according to the report, 65% of the doors were unsecured. Can you respond to the report for the record and were there any improvements made as a result of the report? Yes, I do have a copy of the report and there were improvements made, uh, tremendous improvements made. So. Um, if you would like to have a copy of the report, we do have that report. We, we have a copy. I just wanted to know your response oh, we, to the report. Yes, we do have a copy of the completed report where we have property management staff follow up. And on that same report, we had them indicate actions taken mm -hmm. to address those repairs in addition to indicate whether or not, you know, um, if at the time they found the door open, we asked for actions taken in order to complete the repair. And so they provided an update and they indicated that the doors were repaired. Okay. Okay. So I have a copy of the report with the responses that we received from the properties. Okay, that would be very helpful. Um, for Ms. Francois, yes, can you just kind of sum up, how do you measure success for MAP, the MAP program? Mm -hmm. And can you answer that question um, in light of what came out of Council Member Reynoso's and Council Member Ayala's um, questions and you know their their passion for what's happening in their districts within their MAP programs. So how do you measure success? Um, so I think you know the textbook answer is that we are in the middle of an evaluation. You'll see those results. 
Um, but for us personally, for my team who works hard on this every day, for the engagement staff that's on the ground, um, we measure it by how many people are showing up in this process to say, we want to see something done, we want to play an active role in that, and we want to understand what it means for the public to be a part of public safety. So in my testimony, when I said 21,000 people have been engaged in this process, to us, that is an indicator of some level of success. This is our first round doing that, so we will compare that against how we do in future years, of course. Um, through programmatic contacts, we've had 500,000 people, almost nearly 499 something odd thousand people um, be connected to programming through MAP, and I'm saying contacts because some of those people obviously could be repetitive. Um, in the evaluation, we will have a better understanding of res resident perception of our um, work. That is very important because MAP has uh, more than one goal. It wasn't just about reducing crime. It was about um, increasing safety and perceptions of safety, and there's the only way you can know that is to ask people. So we will see survey results on that. Um, the other thing was to increase um, community cohesion, which to me is spoken to by the number of people, as I said, engaged in this process. Those are the ways that I would measure success. Do I think that there is a point where we can say we have been successful? Um, if one person is shot, if there's one shot fired, one person is robbed, I don't know that we could say that. We may never get to that point, but it's to me it's about constantly iterating and working on it and having people who um, understand that experience um, at the forefront of this. You know, empathy, transparency, accountability, those things are free. It, it doesn't cost anything to implement that. Um, but we have to find a way to operationalize those values with our agency partners and track the way we're determining whether or not empathy and accountability and transparency are deployed. And that's the way I think that we measure success on our team. Okay, thank you. And I do have one last question. This is, this is the last one. For NYCHA, please provide an update on the removal of non-essential scaffolds and sidewalk sheds. And is there a plan to remove the non-essential scaffolding and sidewalk sheds at the non-MAP developments? And, um, and again, the pictures that I sent up, you can see where there's scaffolding around that senior development. And the um, person's shopping cart is affixed to the scaffold in that photo. So um, can you please just let us know what's happening with the scaffold? We will get back to you on all of the scaffolding. We have those numbers and, and we're constantly working to take those down. I need to check. Okay. All right. Well, all right, so that concludes our questions. We have, uh, we actually have 13 pages of questions, so um, we'll follow up with those, um, and we'll be expecting the questions that we had today. Be you were gonna say something? Go ahead. So we have Mike. Thank you for that question. So we have a total of 132,618 linear feet as of, uh, well, this says February 15, 2019. We'll perhaps have to provide an update. That was about three months ago. Um, it says here, uh, LL2 construction sheds. What does that mean? So this is, Again, we'll get you all of this information, but uh, local law 11 work, this would be the municipal um, construction sheds of about 28,000 linear feet. We have local law 11 emergency sheds, which is a roughly around 61,000 linear feet. Um, we've got um, project sheds, so those would be associated to construction projects um, for roofing or other facade pieces around 18,921 linear feet. Um, so that is just, those are just projects that are, that would not be part of the mayoral roofing. The mayoral roofing program has around 23,463 linear feet of sheds. Every time you do a construction project, you have to put up the, the shedding to protect uh, the, the residents and, and then that covers around 483 buildings that have sheds. Okay. Uh, the question was just about the plan of the removal, not the... You know, like the, the numbers, right? The, all of the shows that you have. Yeah. And just to let you know, from uh, January 18th through uh, February 15th, 2019, approximately 36,500 uh, linear feet of shedding has been removed. Okay. 
All right, so again, we'll follow up with you on that. And so that concludes this level of questions. Um, thank you so much for your testimony today. Clearly, we have um, you know, a lot of work to do together. Um, I will say that there has, no, there, there has not been um, funding allocated for, so far, for um, Woodson Houses. And so we should have a conversation about that as well, collectively, and um, do roundtable discussions to really talk about and drill down on the safety and security amongst our developments and what we can all do together. So thank you so much, and enjoy your day. The next panel we will hear from is Ms. Lois Green in Pink Houses, Karen Caldwell in Pink Houses, Mary Riddick, Pink Houses, Clarice, Cal Clarissa, I can't make this out, Patterson Houses, Inez Jackson, Polo Ground, Gail Baez, Polo Ground. Ms. Glover, you could come up. Ms. Glover, Washington Houses, Letitia McNeil, Holmes. Oh. <laughs> Holmes Towers, Lakeisha Taylor, Holmes Tower, Maggie Larkins, Far Rockaway, and Helen Red, Bailey Houses. Maggie Larkins. Jeanette Salcedo, Salcedo, Castle Hill, Christine Brown, Castle Hill, David Grant, Los Sordes, Sandra Tapia, Bushwick Houses, Rochelle McGee, Bushwick Houses, Patigan Joylin, St. Nicholas Houses, and Adele Braxton, St. Nicholas Houses. Okay. So you can begin your testimony, and I would please ask that you state your name clearly and the development that you represent. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to speak loud and clear. Good morning, Committee on Public Housing and Committee on Public Safety. Thank you for having this oversight hearing on safety and security in NYCHA. My name is Crystal Glover, and I am a resident of Washington Houses. I saw on the 12 o'clock news about a month ago about a man stealing a kiosk machine from a NYCHA management office on First Avenue. The kiosk is where we, is where our yearly resident affidavit information is stored. It was mentioned once and they pulled the report probably because they don't want the residents to be alarmed. But wait, it gets worse. Here is where I fit in. A few weeks ago, I come into my building at 9 p.m. I look into my mailbox and remove a letter. 
At 11.30 p.m., my son comes home and thanks me for finding and putting his ID in the mailbox. He said it must have fallen from off his neck when he was going down the stairs that day. I told him it wasn't me that put it in there, and the mailbox, the postal people don't work that late. So the next day, I decided to put my key in other boxes to see if it would fit. And sure enough, one other box opened. I was shocked. I have proof and I have witnesses. I emailed my property manager. She replied and said the mailbox issue has been brought to the attention of the PSA and she notified the maintenance supervisors and that they are looking into the matter. I also spoke to her by phone and she expressed how serious a matter this is. I have not heard from her since. I went to the post office. I went to the post office to have my mail stopped and to make arrangements to be able to pick my mail up there because I don't trust it coming to my mailbox. Mr. Bell, the supervisor at the post office, made me fill out a card that says the mail will be saved from that day to the day I pick to the day I pick. You see, I can't afford a P.O. box. Thank God I had him write a letter to confirm our conversation. Guess what? The mail didn't stop and it's still coming to my mailbox. I want the world to know, especially NYCHA residents, that anybody can get into your mailbox and NYCHA don't give a damn. Anybody can also get into your apartment too. One day I come home, put my key in the door, but the door was already open. I was shocked and did notice a person running down the stairs. It's criminal, it's a felony. I sent emails to the borough office, CC Diana Ayala, my city council rep, and even the public advocate, as well as Monica Morales from PIX11 News about the mailbox situation. None of them have gotten back to me. I also want you to know that the NYCHA Federal Monitor, Bart Schwartz, formed an advisory committee. He gave an advisory board meeting open to NYCHA residents. The meeting was in Brooklyn. I went, Mr. Schwartz promised me openly after I slipped him my question that he would be willing to come to Washington houses. I haven't heard from him yet. This issue with the mailbox and apartment doors, the fact that anybody can get into your house and get into your box is very troubling and I want to know what is going to be done about it. NYCHA in the city looks at residents as poor, welfare, retired, disabled, disenfranchised, under, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, voiceless, uh, um, uh, socioeconomically deprived, uh, and we are citizens, all this money, and I can go on and on and on. As they look at us as garbage. And the fact that we residents don't raise enough hell gives them the right to walk all over us. They put smoke-free policies together first and then ask what our opinion is later. I know because I was on the panel. I got on the panel after I called and made a com complaint about the cigarettes and the reefer smoke coming into my apartment. Residents, my email address is gcrystal2234 at gmail.com. Criminals, politics are going to have our butts in the streets if we don't get busy. It's up to the residents. We got to take charge. These tenant associations that aren't doing, that aren't sticking to their bylaws, they're not doing their jobs, and NYCHA and resident engagements will tell you, oh, well, your bylaws and your, res and your tenants associations are democratic and independent, and we can't come up there and tell them nothing, but yet they asses are there when it's time for elections. Okay, so those of you, them young people that came here today, take down my Gmail um, uh, notice because these district leaders who don't even really, they deal with judges and so forth. There's so much garbage going on in these developments. Anytime I can open up people's mailboxes, I told the postal man, the supervisor, my mail is still 
come into my apartment, he didn't even pay me any attention. They look at us as garbage, whether you're working poor, whether you're disabled, whether you whatever you are. New York City Housing Authority employees make more money than in any other state in New York City. They get crazy money and they aren't even doing their jobs. So you residents who have tennis associations, if you don't have a TA, you form one. And you tell them bums that are, that are your TAs, tell them you want to buy a copy of the bylaws. 10% of the membership in most bylaws is what has to, you have to be a member in most tennis associations. And you have to have 10% of the membership to address these fools that are that are leader that are so-called leaders in your developments. And on that note, I thank you very much. And I'm hoping, because Ms. Samuels is very professional, and I'm just like Bert Swartz, the so-called monitor who promised me that he was coming to my development and did not contact me yet, he's the federal monitor. I'm hoping that somebody today that's listening will tell me what should I do that my key won't fit in other people's mailboxes. Okay. Because that's a federal offense and it's a disgrace. And my ancestors didn't bleed and die for this garbage. We are United States citizens and we deserve better. Thank you, Ms. Glover. Thank you. Uh, someone here from NYCHA? Okay, can you take her information? Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Leticia. I'm from the Holmes Towers. My concern is I feel like Holmes Towers and um, Isaacs are kind of falling on, under the radar because of its location. In all actuality, it's a lot of unsafe conditions going on in our development. One, I'm concerned because they're proposing to put a 50-story building in our development when the current issues that are going on, be it safety, environmental issues, whatever is going on right now, it's not of a concern but this building. Our door has been broke so many times, which I know this issue has come up, but at the same time, the, the, the intercom doesn't work for, for our guests to come in and out, which causes people to prop doors open so that their family members could come in and out. Then there's the trespassers. There's the drugs that's going on. Listen, I grew up in Mitchell Projects. That's where I'm from. I couldn't go out to play as a kid because my mother feared me not returning home. I do not want that for my children. I want my children to be able to go out. I want my children to be able to go out, make friends, and flourish, and grow the way that they're supposed to as children. I don't want my daughter to continue to ask me, mommy, why can't I go outside? And my answer is, baby, right now is not the time. I don't want to keep telling her that because I know how that feels to be jammed up in a house because of safety issues. And at Holmes Towers right now, it's a very big safety issue. After a certain time, I will not even go out to throw my garbage out because there's someone lurking in the hallway. And it's like, what do you do? There are times where I have to go outside to take my daughter to school and I'm stepping over homeless people. And it's like, like what I'm fearing for the safety of me and my children. And it's really, it's really getting really, really bad. There's bar, I, from last I've known, it's illegal to have barbecues on, on NYCHA property. Every since, it, every since it hit 70 degrees, there's charcoal fumes coming in my window, and I have very young children. What is that doing to their respiratory system? You have a no smoke policy in place, but there's charcoal fumes coming in my window in addition to the marijuana, in addition to the K2, in addition to everything else that's being smoked. Then, let's go to the prostitution that's going on. I come in from work, the elevators are being held up because of the traffic. It's like Grand Central Station on 92nd Street and 1st Avenue. It's like Grand Central. There's, no, there's cameras on one side and no cameras on the other side, so what any 
someone who knows the way around, they're gonna go to the side where there's no cameras. So my question is, where's the money for the rest of the cameras? Because of course you can't put cameras in one place and not put them in the other because then that's where the traffic's gonna go. So I'm just lost as to what's going on with homes because I just feel like it's falling under the radar and the more it falls under, the worse it gets. It's, it's, it's horrible right now. It's really, really bad. Has anybody gotten killed yet? No, fortunately, but honestly, it's only a matter of time. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Lakeisha. I'm also from Holmes. I'm gonna also speak on the safety issue and what's going on at Holmes. There was a time when Holmes was the place to be. We were rated number one projects and everyone wanted to live there. People sued actually to move in to Holmes because it was in a great neighborhood. It's on 92nd Street between First Avenue and York Avenue. You, people will believe, oh, you speak so well because this is where we came from. People wanted to live there. And as she said, they wanna build a beautiful luxury home Built, building there of 50 stories on top of buildings that are only 25 stories, again, because we have this great view of the East River. But again, like Letitia just said, we have this problem of homelessness because again, what is NYCHA doing? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Again, as you heard the this, this pomp and circumstance of, oh, there's vandalism. Yes, there is, but we have these crap doors that keep breaking. And why is that? Because of these contracts that you keep giving to these people that, again, give us these doors that what? Break, and then what? Here you go, you get a five-year contract with this vendor, and then what? Your management forgets to renew it. And then what? We have to wait for them to figure out who you gonna give this contract to again? And then what? You give it to the same people that what? Don't fix it, don't know what to do. The same thing with our elevators. Again, I just got stuck in the elevator on the weekend because why? I was speaking to the elevator. I have a list of all my numbers, my ticket numbers that I give in to say that the elevator is not working. And what happens? Me and my two sons are stuck in the elevator and I have to speak calmly because I don't want to get them excited. But, but why? Because time after time, I continue to do what I'm supposed to do and give in my ticket numbers, but what does NYCHA do? The same shim sham, bamboozle that they have done for years and years, not follow up, not continue to do what they're supposed to do to their residents as we are. They look down on us because we live in public housing. And like she just said, we are people, yes, there are some people on welfare, there are some people who are retired, there are seniors, there are working people who work in public, there are people who serve, there are people who, are, who have been in the military. We are people, we are humans, we have done service, we have done everything we need to do. And there are people who don't do what they need to do. There's a woman in my building who lets a bum in every day. And again, we have complained. We have told them, this is the man that urinates in the staircase. This is the man that um, poops in the staircase. We have reported this to the management. And what has management done? Absolutely nothing. This is the same man that our NYCHA workers have to step over to clean the staircase. And I feel for them because this is their job and they're trying their best. They have reported it to the police. We have, I personally have a great relationship with our local policemen. My children love our local policemen because they are not afraid because I raised them not to be afraid of the policemen because this is what we are supposed to do as parents because I want them to grow up and be safe and learn and live and grow and, and prosper. But again, NYCHA is not doing what they are supposed to do. What happens? 10 years? Uh, you expect these cameras to last 10 years, but are you doing the upkeep? Are you, fo are you focusing? I've had a neighbor tell me, someone stole her key right outside her door, and guess what? There's a camera right there. They told her she could not look at it. They told her the police were supposed to look at it, and no one looked at it.
They stole it. She was terrified that someone was going to come into her house. So again, where is your connection with your, with your residents? There is nothing. So speak to your manager, speak to them. You can't speak to your manager. You have to go through your housing assistant. When you have a problem, you have to follow the chain and the chain is broken. The chain is broken. And like she said that her mailbox kid, guess what? We have the same problem as at homes. Because you know why? Because housing keeps going to these same vendors that give you the same cheap product, and it guess what? It's broken. How's NYCHA is broken, and I'm sorry, you're not trying to fix it. It's been broken for years. I grew up in housing, and guess what? Homeless people have been sleeping in, in, in housing projects for years, because guess what? Those doors have been open for years. So the mayor has made a new, new law about the homelessness, the homeless population, and this is the biggest problem. You are making these laws and it's becoming a bigger problem. You don't wanna, you don't wanna arrest them, but who's suffering? NYCHA residents. You're making this law about smoking and, and housing, and guess what? You're not enforcing them. I've been dealing with my neighbor underneath me for three years. She's been smoking, she's been having her music on, I've been writing letters, I've been telling my, my manager for three years. Her file is downtown for termination. Who's suffering? Me and my family, for three years. Who is suffering? I am. But you're not doing anything. You have these rules and regulations, but you're not enforcing them. You keep going to these same vendors and you're not doing anything. You've been wasting money for years. And who's suffering? We are. Time needs to change. Time keeps moving on and we keep suffering. This is ridiculous that we keep suffering. You keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. You say, oh, call the, call the 718 number and put in your ticket. Why am I pausing? Because my ticket is in. My ticket has been in for two years, and I'm still waiting for my closet to be fixed. I'm waiting for my sink to be fixed. I'm waiting for my toilet to be fixed, and I'm waiting. And this is sad. These are the stories I hear from the elderly people. They don't want to come outside because they can't sit on the bench anymore. And this is the, this is the condition you have these people sitting in because they're sad and they're afraid to come outside and they know the cameras don't work because it's raining and the water has set in in the Thank camera you, and, they, and they're Thank sorry. You. I'm sorry, but Thank one and they're just sad. Thank you. Thank and you. we need to fix it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you have all of the her list of issues. Thank you. I'm sorry. I meant to mention about the policing. You can't, the police are not going to come and kick people's doors down unless you call them and make a report. So you can sit and grill the cops all day if you want to. They are not coming up there to knock anyone's door down. You have to put a complaint in first and they have to do an investigation. Thank you. Things Mr. run by protocol for those who don't know that, those that's getting paid all this money that don't know, because we residents, we know. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for your testimony today, ladies. Thank you so much, as well as the baby. We heard <laughs> loud and clear. Next, we'll hear from Shavasia Robinson with Wagner Houses, Latrell Baxton with Boulevard Houses, Robin Wilder, Butler Houses, Terry Hurd, Butler Houses. Lisa Kenna, Van Dyke Houses. Keith Ramsey, East Chester Gardens. Miss Carmen Quiones, Douglas Houses. Helena Bell, Polo Ground. Shalevia Pearson, Seth Lowe.
And I have here, the, those are the last two NYCHA residents, correct? Did anybody else uh, fill out a slip? Now is your moment. One more NYCHA resident. Ma'am, ma'am, you filled out a slip? All righty, now is your chance. Now is your chance. If you didn't fill out a slip, now is your chance, and then you can go up there. Oh. Barbara G. Barber, Drew Hamilton, and after the last um, resident panel, then we'll hear from. Ma'am, you can go up. Ma'am. Okay. We want to do Brooklyn Defenders at the same time with Rosetta Cochran, but that'll be with the Brooklyn Defenders. And Gregory Walt Waltman. Okay. You may begin. Hello, my name is Shavasia Robinson. I'm a resident at Wagner Houses. Thank you for having me. And I hate to cut you off. I do want you to, you can stop with the time real quick. So I, I do want you to stick to um, the time because we actually have to leave out of the chamber. Okay, no really That's quick. the issue. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. I just want to speak on the MAP program and my development. Okay, once again, I, my name is Shavasia Robinson. I'm a resident of Wagner Houses. I'm a mayor action plan stakeholder and also a member of the Step Tech Committee, which is the crime prevention, through crime prevention through environmental design. I've been a part of this initiative for about one and a half years now, and I'm very excited about our INSTAT project. We will be beautifying the basketball court as well as an empty space that's being underutilized by two shipping containers and also being used as an unofficial dog park. The beautification of these spaces will allow us to bring a variety of programming and services to our residents and, we, and that will promote pride in place. We work with different organizations that focus on the youth and youth development and we have multi-generational programs as well. So, cause we're trying to promote a positive interaction among our neighbors to ensure and increase public safety. Since I started with this initiative, I've grown a great deal and I've learned how to interact with the youth and the members of the community in a positive level. I look forward to the implementation of this project as well as being a member of the Mayor's Action Plan for many years to come. I also look forward to seeing the duplication of this initiative in other areas throughout the city. I look forward to working with the PSA 5 NCOs. I look forward to look at working with the city council and other community members. And I thank you for listening. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Don't all go at once. <laughs> I'll do it. Okay, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I come here today, thank you for having the, the hearing. Um, there is a problem with safety and security in NYCHA, but it's, it's not the way you think. I, I am the resident association president of East Chester Gardens. Partnering with NYCHA has been great, difficult, confusing over the years. It's, uh, it's up and down, but NYCHA has plenty of problems, but I do believe that despite its issues, I believe NYCHA tries to do as best as can in the safety security department. Now, in 1965, uh, when Monaghan wrote about the common destruction of the black family, the out of wedlock birth rate was 25% amongst blacks. In 1991, it was 68%. In 2011, it's 72%. In 2019, it's 77%. And what did Marcus Aurelius, the Roman philosopher, mean when he said poverty is the mother of crime. He wasn't trying to justify crime. The majority of people, poor people anyway, uh, they, they work on a straight and narrow. Uh, but he wasn't trying to justify crime. He was trying to be realistic. Some of the people who have been consigned to society's margins were considerate 
that they haven't much to lose by breaking the rule, and they'd be right. In 2019, Facebook, World Star, Hip Hop, and Media take up a three of the social media platforms that show our people in a shameful, disgraceful, disgusting display that destroys our image every day, all types of shameful, disgusting acts, crimes being committed for the world to see. Do I blame certain races for not wanting our people around them and in their stores? No, because these same people live next door to me. These same people are in my lobby. They break my doors. They, they barbecue and they're on the roof. They drunk and they high. Their illegal animals are running free. Their kids are running around recklessly. They play their music all hours of the day and night. They rolling dice. This is them. <laughs> and this is considered normal hood behavior. The majority of the cultural people are the women. And what it is, they're violent. They'll fight without a second thought, and they don't have no respect for no man. They'll get up in the man's face any, in any minute and threaten them, and, and they'll fight. And they're not afraid of the police. That They'll fight the police, too. So what it is with this violent, dysfunctional people who live in public housing, the ones that are suffer are the decent residents, the seniors that are scared to death to sit on the bench, the working residents, the children that don't have a shot, it's the majority of us. The illegal occupants are rampant. There are many, uh, so many residents renting rooms. You can't keep up with it. There needs to be a special department in the Housing Authority that deals with that. I requested you have an exploratory committee also on subleasing and illegal occupants in NYCHA to punish the residents that do not follow rules and regulations. I will give you a copy of this. Okay. And um, I'll send it to you because it, it was a little bit much. Okay. All right. You're right about that. It was a lot. It was a lot. It was a lot. It was a lot. Was a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, um, chair people of the committees of the public housing and uh, public safety. My name is Ike Satoris, and I'm the president of Alfred E. Smith Houses. Um, ironically enough, I live right across the street from police headquarters. Um, and when they evacuate, they actually evacuate to Alfred E. Smith. Uh, and we still have issues. We have a shelter of approximately 300 people who decided that they could use our grounds to do things. And even though the doors might be fixed, it still has not resolved the issues and the problems that we have with um, safety in terms of that. I personally want to thank Councilwoman Margaret Chin, my Councilwoman, because the cameras that we do have, she gave the money for. But one of the biggest issues and the biggest problems that you know we face is that there's a certain sense of, or there's certain employees in NYCHA who think that residents in public housing are unsophisticated enough to understand how things should be. Um, and that being said, the only way that things can really work is if we do a we and we work together. The NCO program, I have to tell you, is really working from PSA 4. Um, and my residents do attend their blockbusters, and they have listened. And we have had improvement in terms of what we do. So. It's about having conversations, and like every other development, we have issues. Our biggest issue, I think, across the board is that people think that because we live in public housing, this is public housing, they can come and step all over our grounds, bring their dogs, do all kinds of things because this is public housing. The reality of it is that it's against the law if they are not there as guests and if they're not invited. Um, and I think that needs to be publicized, that people just can't come into public housing and do whatever. And that includes kids coming into our neighborhood and just going through with their rollerblades and scaring the mess out of people and children because they feel it's okay because it's public housing. Riding their bicycles, the same thing. I hate city bike because we have one not on our grounds, right off the grounds, and people, take the bikes and they think they could ride through our development without being cautious of the fact that we have a lot of seniors with walkers. And so I say that, I say all of this because 
At the end of the day, we the residents of public housing are taxpayers, unlike the president and all his cronies. We pay taxes and we, it's not about we deserve, it's our right as American citizens to have these things. Thank you. Thank you so much. How you doing? I'm Daquan from Wagner Projects. Um, I'm here with Matt. I just recently came home, so it's like I'm trying a new transition of trying to change my life. And basically, since I've been coming home, I actually got 25 other people that I used to grow up with to get our OSHA 30s and trainers with the Elbow Fight Back program. So I'm just trying to sit here and benefit and get them to think better and think differently. But I like like a couple people were saying when I was listening, everybody kept saying it's like it's the gangs, the safeties with the gangs, the kids in the lobby, smoking, drinking, everything. We just all gotta talk to each other. I feel like if people know what people are going through, it'll be better this situation because a lot of people go through different things and do things for different reasons. So it's like they could grow bad, they couldn't have food, that's why it's probably a lot of robberies. You don't know if somebody ate, they gotta do what they gotta do to eat. So I think we just need to reach out and to talk to all the young people and see if we can stop them from going down the wrong path before they make it. It's just all communication to make everybody feel like family. If we're a community, we gotta start acting like one. And that's really all I had to say. Thank you, Daquan, you said? Thank you for your powerful testimony and thank you for coming down to City Hall. Um, it's very noble of you to come down here and testify today. I have a question for you. What are some things uh, that we can do or what are some things that um, MAP can do to be better? What are some things that we can do to strengthen the program? Well, for one, it's a good program. We got good people that care, and I feel like that actually care. So uh, for one, to say is like, you gotta get people that's not just there for the money or for the publicity. You gotta get them there that actually care. It's different when somebody actually cares about you, and you can feel it, it makes you wanna change, it makes you wanna do better. Like you feel like somebody else is watching Absolutely. over you. So I think it's that, and to keep the projects busy, basketball tournaments, mm -hmm cook out music, just have everybody talking and communicating with one another. And that's how you start to realize and see what people are going through and try to help them, prevent them from doing what they probably about to do. It could be suicide, it could be trying to join a gang because you don't have, you feel like nobody's there for you, or just being a follower. So it's like, you just talk to them before it happens. Because a lot of stuff happens just because of following. And it's like, you want to be down or you want attention. So I just say reach out, talk to them, and show them that you care. Proud of you. Yeah. Stay on the straight and narrow. Yeah, that's Stay a part of the program. And uh, I, I'm just, uh, yep. you know, I don't get emotional all the time, but a yeah. little teary eyed sitting here now. Yeah. Um, but very proud of you. Yeah. Stay on the right track. You're a leader. Yeah. And I want you to um, yeah. stay on that path. I, w I could have been where you were at, too. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Okay. Rosetta Cochran. Nobody tell Anka my wife I was in here crying, all right? Gregor. <laughs> like, I just want to jump up and hug him, right? <laughs> and um, Emily. Ponder Williams. So Brooklyn Defender Services, Neighborhood Defender Services, Brooklyn Defender Services. And the last two, Gregory Waltman and oh, Erica Overton. Join the panel. Is Erica Overton still here? Okay, it's the last panel. And you can start. Okay. Hi, 
apologize one second. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Anka Gorgori. I'm a supervising attorney in the civil justice practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. Uh, I don't want to take up too much more of everybody's time, and I really want to. Can you speak just a little? Oh, better. yes, no problem. Thanks. Is that better? Um, I said I don't want to take up too much more of everyone else's time, and I really want to focus on our client, uh, Rosetta Cochran, who is here to testify. Um, but I did want to first thank the council for the opportunity to testify today about safety and security in NYCHA developments. Um, and we're going to focus our testimony on what we see as NYCHA's continued over-reliance on the NYPD for safety um, and on the criminal justice system instead of other recommended safety measures that we've all heard about here today. Through our clients, we see over-policing, regular false arrests on NYCHA property all the time. And I wanted to touch on something that uh, Chairperson Ambry Samuel touched on earlier is that it's not just these arrests that are a problem, but the collateral consequences that come with these arrests. Um, specifically, we see NYCHA going incredibly hard on eviction proceedings um, based on these arrests that often result in dismissals in criminal court. Um, we see these eviction proceedings, which they call termination of tenancy proceedings, often used as punitive rather than preventative. We see NYCHA deferring to and trusting any allegation made by the NYPD, even when the allegations contradict everything they know about a long-term tenant. We've touched on this a lot today, but we also see the continued use of NYCHA's so-called not wanted list, which was talked about a lot today as the trespass list, but we've heard NYCHA call it their not wanted list. Um, and these are not of non-residents. A lot of the people on the trespass list are actually NYCHA residents just trying to come home. And NYCHA doesn't follow up with these arrests to see if they were dismissed or they were never prosecuted in the first place. They stay on the list regardless. Um, so we have many client stories in our written testimony uh, that I would encourage the council to read over, including recommendations. But again, I wanted to get to Ms. Cochran's testimony as soon as possible, um, who I think has a perfect example of what we're seeing is, you know, at a time when there's egregious conditions in NYCHA, delays for repairs, everything we've heard today about lack of cameras, locked doors, lighting, NYCHA seems to be focusing their energy on aggressively pursuing eviction for insignificant and, and unsubstantiated criminal allegations. Hello, <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Rosetta Cochran, and I have lived in a NYCHA development for 30 years. I have always had a good reputation in the neighborhood with my management office, with most of the people in the neighborhood. The kids and the people in the neighborhood call me Ma. That's because I like to feed my neighborhood. I'm known for keeping the kids out of the building, telling them that you know we need to keep the building clean, I'm a single mom, I raised seven kids. Five of my children are adults now, two of them still live home with me. My youngest son is still living with me and then he's having a lot of problems. Um, he's 17 and he has a problem with the Texas keep stopping him, keep frisking him, uh, you know, searching his pockets and stuff, and all he's doing is sitting outside, just with his friends, they talking, they laughing. He's not, he's not in any game, he don't get in trouble, he's a good student in school. Um, it really seems like NYCHA and NYPD are a team together against all of the tenants I myself have been targeted by NYPD and actually, well, currently evicted from NYCHA as a result of, I'm still living in my apartment while my eviction is appealed and is pending. 
I was evicted because I was caught up in a raid of my building where over 40 people were picked up. They accused me of dealing drugs even, even though the undercover cop, well, the undercover officer description did not match mine's. They was they were still. Take like, your time. I know I'm really nervous. I went through no a problem. lot. Even though the officers found out that I wasn't the person that they was looking for, the criminal charges against me were still eventually dis the criminal charges against me was dismissed, but NYCHA still went forward with the eviction. Despite my good relationship with the management and my neighborhood testifying on my behalf, they was, I was innocent. NYCHA took the arrest officer's word over mine. It's, it really hurts, it really hurts me because not only have they known me for, as a tenant for 30 years, but the city has spent more money defending the officers who testified against me in a lawsuit than they have spent on any officer in the city. Um, mm -hmm. NYPD is keeping its tenants safe. Oh, oh, after this experience, it has become clear to me that NYCHA, NYCHA cares more about their relationship with NYPD than they keep in the tenants than in keeping the tenants safe. This is also because this this also became clear because at the time NYCHA was trying to evict me. All the tenants in the building was complaining about how dark the lights are, they dim, we can't see what's going on. We have traffic in and out of our yards and stuff. They never had cameras. We still don't have any cameras. They put a little bright light out now, but if you work like most of the people in our building do, you're still scared to come out six o'clock in the morning and come home late at night because the light the lighting is still messed up. So and the lock on the door. Yeah, no locks on our door, the front door and the back door. They made it public for the people to walk through our building. People from the street who don't live in the building can walk through the building all day long, all night long. And they be around on the side of the windows, people urinating. There's a lot of things going on that I think NYCHA need to realize. And the cops is out there, but they don't believe nothing anybody say. They still listen to us and tell us to go to the precinct to put a report in. So thank you for hearing me speak about what's going on in my neighborhood. I'm just so nervous I have to speak right now. Thank you so much for your testimony and we'll make sure that we follow up with NYCHA and, um, and let's talk after. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Emily Ponder Williams. I'm a supervising attorney at Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. Uh, and I also want to briefly speak to uh, what I see as the inconsistency in NYCHA's practice of aggressively prosecuting termination of tenancy proceedings. Uh, while we've heard a lot today about uh, their renewed focus on partnerships, engagement, and safety not involving the criminal justice system, uh, because in our experience, that is not what we are seeing behind the closed doors that are uh, NYCHA's termination of tenancy proceedings. Uh, so I just want to speak briefly about a couple of examples and make some recommendations. Uh, for example, last year, NDS represented a 58-year-old resident, Ms. Smith, whose 24-year-old grandson was arrested in the lobby of her building. When asked whether he knew uh, anyone living there, Thomas stated that his grandmother did, even though he did not. The NYPD proceeded to charge Thomas with trespassing in his grandmother's building. However, the NYPD forwarded information about his arrest to NYCHA for the termination of his tenancy. NYCHA then accused Ms. Smith of allowing Thomas to live with her without obtaining permission and began termination of tenancy proceedings on this basis and the fact of Thomas's arrest. 
When Ms. Smith first appeared for the termination of tenancy hearing without an attorney, she was told she could either agree to permanently exclude Thomas or face the risk of losing her apartment at a hearing. Only after NDS took on her case and pointed out the weak evidence that connected Thomas to the apartment and Ms. Smith to the alleged illegal activity uh, was she able to get a more favorable agreement that did not involve permanent exclusion, which would have barred Thomas from even visiting the apartment. Without an attorney, Ms. Smith, like many others, would have chosen to avoid the risk of losing her home by permanently excluding her grandson uh, from her apartment and effectively her life. Uh, another example, Ms. Miller, a 30-year-old, uh, an NDS client with a 30-year-old, 30-year uh, addiction history, faced the termination of her tenancy based on her arrest for possessing controlled substances in her home. When she was identified as a candidate for the Manhattan Drug Court Program, she was allowed to defer any criminal sentencing, provided she completed an extensive inpatient and outpatient drug rehabilitation program. Upon completion of that program, her case would be dismissed. But rather than staying the termination of her tenancy proceedings to give Ms. Miller an opportunity to reap the benefits of that program, NYCHA moved forward with its hearing proceedings. Thanks to hours of work from our staff, Ms. Miller successfully fought those charges and stayed in her home. But countless others are victims of the adversarial approach that punish, pushes residents toward termination hearings even when they're actively engaged in a pretrial diversion program meant to promote rehabilitation and reentry. As a result, they're deprived of a stable home that would allow them to continue their recovery upon completion. Yet evicting residents who have been rehabilitated through a court-sanctioned diversion program does not make NYCHA any safer. These practices, uh, these practices, um, sorry, my, quickly my recommendations. Um, NYCHA should decline to, to pursue termination of tenancy proceedings where residents are engaged in or have successfully completed alternative to incarceration programs. And additionally, NYCHA should reduce the use of stipulations of settlement that include permanent exclusion particularly where fa the family member does not reside in the apartment or can provide evidence of rehabilitation. Thank you for your time and for having this hearing today. Good afternoon, council members, um, general counsel. Uh, my name is Greg Waltman. I have a clean energy company called G1 Quantum. Um, it was inspiring to hear the heartfelt testimony from um, so many NYCHA residents today um, in line with HUD official Lynn Patton and uh, public advocate Jumani Williams and their advocacy on behalf of, of, of the NYCHA residents. And as one testified today, it seems that it's more than just throwing money at the problem. It's actually having people that have an interest and want to see people improve their conditions and want to um, work with people as opposed to working against them. And obviously, I can't speak to firsthand um, you know, experience with that to an extent, but it seems that there are budgetary concerns and constraints that are hindering uh, the type of relationship um, that should be created with NYCHA officials and residents so that positive synergies can be created. And, and when, when I speak to that, I speak to that in, with respect to the Green New Deal and a solution set forth and uh, proposals that have been presented to the council and um, for different types of budgetary concerns to be um, essentially censored by the media value uh, issues and hyper-protectionism to impair funding for different types of NYCHA-related issues and budgetary fiscal con con constraints is, is just not appropriate. I, I feel that, you know, there, there are these programs in place and, and people have the responsibility to not try to create uh, entrapping type of legal conditions that perpetuate and stymie a, per a person's progress in life, but, but find the type of balance necessary to advance 
not only you know with, within the constraints of NYCHA, but uh, the type of um, context in a whole. And, and when you, you're able to parse through the value illusion of choice of solutions and pairing budgetary and fiscal constraints, you're able to address these problems in the proper context. And I, and I feel like um, public ad advocate Jamani Williams, uh, Lynn Patton, HUD official, and other, other types of um, advocates on behalf of, of NYCHA in, in resolving this issue have, have um, you, know, you know, paid a big price to bring this to their attention. And I'd just like to reiterate that these solutions do in fact exist, and once you parse through value imposing upon the council um, to create an illusionary type of budgetary constraint, it, you begin to see the solution and be able to create the synergies that I was speaking to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for your testimony today. And just for the record, I wanna state that we received testimony from the Equitable Infrastructure Group for the record, and we also received photos for the record um, from Franklin Avenue um, houses that depict, which is a senior development that depicts um, homelessness and um, some other issues. And we also received um, testimony from Center for Court Innovation for the record. Um, I want to thank Council Madiba Denny for your hard work, as well as Ho Jose Condi for your hard work. And I know Ricky, but Ricky Chala for um, your work. Thank you so much. And do you have oh, I got to thank Daniel Eddies, uh, Casey Addison, and Evan Singh uh, for their work, and my uh, uh, legislative director, Jordan Gibbons. Thank you. And that will conclude the hearing, the hearing today with the Committee on Public Safety and the Committee on Public Housing, Safety and Security in NYCHA, June 6, 2019.